Commission, and I'll uh, be presiding over the hearing today. Um, and what this is, and we're going to go around and introduce ourselves in a second, but this is what we call a show and tell. Uh, the applicant is going to show us what the project looks like and what, we'll do, what they're proposing to do. And if there's neighbors here, I'll we'll find out in a second, they'll uh, be showing us uh, where they live and uh, possibly we'll even go to where they live and whatnot, depending upon what they would like us to do. Okay? Um, so I'm going to start with we'll you over here. I'm going to start with Rod. We'll go around this way introducing ourselves. Rod McClay, Commissioner. Suzanne Butterfield, Commissioner for Stockbridge. Linda Madison, I'm a coordinator. Karen Colby, I'm Colby. I'm Brian Lane Parnas, I'm the civil engineer for the project. I'm Michael Penrod, resident. I'm Brooke Dingle Dean. Steve Roy, Women Land Fair Architects. Tom Apple, owner's representative. Dylan Kelly, uh, staff writer of the Herald. Linda LaFrance, uh, property adjoining. Roger Shabbat, I live right back here. Paul Ray, I'm one of the owners of the hotel project. Paul Kendall, and I've and led the uh, uh, RQ process of reviewing the downtown hotel option. Uh, Greg Wobel, I'm the general counsel of the National Resources Board. Pete Fellows, two rivers out of Creechy Regional Commission. Ari Rockman Miller, Agency of Agriculture. Okay, well, I think I'm turning it over to you now to show us around. Great. Um, so, as everyone is probably aware, the project is a hotel, restaurant, and conference center. Um, 79 unit hotel, uh, 152 seat restaurant, and 400 seat capacity conference center. Um, so, generally, the buildings are arranged in sort of an L shape, um, and so the, we've staked out some things on the site to just sort of help people get a sense of what's happening here. Um, so, the stakes with the pink flaggings are sort of rough corners of buildings. Um, in order to make it a little easier to understand, you sort of just turn them both into rectangles and know exactly how they're configured, but it gives you a sense of where they are. So, um, the hotel you can see over there, the two pink flags are the, um, what is that? the west end of the hotel. Is there a way to get up there? And yeah, we can walk down this road right here. Yeah. 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 Let's go up there. Do you have anything a little bigger than that? Uh, or? This is what I have for the site visit okay. uh, with okay. all the rain and stuff today. Yeah. I wasn't sure what we were going to be able to do, but I'm happy to hand this around if anybody wants to look once we get over here. <laughs> over here are the uh, west end of the hotel. Um, and then that flag and that flag here to my right are the east end of the hotel building. Um, and then further to the east, um, the two flags that sort of go uh, closer to trees there um, are the end of the um, conference center and restaurant. And then there's two pink flags over there representing the other end of the conference center and the restaurant. Um, the orange stakes that are sort of further out are generally the edges of the various um, parking areas and whatnot. Um, there's also uh, a couple of orange stakes by those large trees over there, which are the, the sort of back edge of the grass um, tent and event area uh, that goes in that corner of the site. Um, and you can see... Can we get over into that tent area? Or is it going to be miserable? It's just there? going to be like this here side. Yeah. 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 I mean, everybody will get wet feet, but we can go over there. Mm -hmm. That's okay, let's go. Mm -hmm. yep. The west end of it. And that one over by that uh, birch tree there is pretty Oh, where is it? Yeah. <laughs> you guys have really uh, taken to heart this concept of. Uh, you're cutting these trees down, but you don't cut down enough. <laughs> it's hard to read this stuff, is what I'm trying to get at. There's no paper. Um, so these trees here will be removed. Yeah. Is that correct? Yep, yeah, because they're interfering with the slope. So generally, the earthwork for the site, um, because of the, the slope, the native slope of the site, earth is generally getting moved from this corner over here to that corner down there to sort of get everything to flatten out to where it's developable. So this is the area where there'll be the most 
remove all of earth um, and then over down in that when you get down over by where like the stormwater system is in that end of the site is where there's most placement of earth is going to be so this area is actually going to be how much 10 to 12 what's that how much you're cutting it's going to be about 10 to 12 feet of cut in this uh, area so it'll be quite a bit lower than where we are now this is your mitigation land up here? Yep, so um, generally this portion of the site um, back into here is the mitigation. And I have a, a exhibits and things we can look at when we get back to the hearing. But yeah. I'll just yeah. yeah. So this, this large field here is, is split between the, um, the project owners and uh, the, 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 the France, the butter. Mm -hmm. I, that, yeah, that's yes. my, I'm the owner of half of that field and the hillside up there. So. I've been paying taxes for 35 years, planning to build a home up there. Interviewed in New Hampshire yesterday, so the home, I would love to build a home up there. I would not like to be looking out over a hotel. So, so where, where you'll hear my steps. Where does your land start exactly? I see, so, I see a grassy area there. So the grassy area is, is one part of it, and then five acres of this, this bigger field here would be the other side. So like where that draw is? Uh, yeah, roughly. I don't know. You guys have, have staked it out, I think, more recently to know exactly where the marker lines are. But roughly. I'm not sure what you were referring to. Oh, yeah. 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 I have to go walk over that walk and drive it Yeah, that'd be great. Those were short. <laughs> <laughs> They've been there a while. Yeah. Behind him is yours. Sir. And as to the mitigation land, could you show them more? The scope of it, like that, that field there, and yep. then it heads yep. towards this, the, the this field here, and yeah. then yeah, it comes yeah. in sort of um, behind the hotel yeah. and up into this wooded area on the hill. Or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. tree right there at the turn. Yep. So the clearing right. would start there and then you don't think there's a stake on the other end of it which you can't see because of all the cars. But um, so just along the frontage here, um, but outside of the wetland buffer uh, and then to the edge of the stream buffer is, is, is about where we can clear along the roadway. Alright, I'm opening up what, what we drove through. Right. Yeah, I'm going to ask you to repeat that down when we get back to the cars. Sure. Um, and then not, I think that wouldn't be bad to look at from back here. So if you look that way, you can see um, the two orange stakes closest to the tree are the back of the parking area that's behind the hotel. So that'll be kind of, there's a little bit of grading back there, but not much. That's pretty much the limit uh, of the uh, development this year. That is towards the fields uh, So this, this one from the side. Do I have it correct that some of the mitigation land is actually was in the Something I don't care. Neighbor. Who else do we have here? You're up. I'm right in. 
to there, right back behind where the stakes are, about, I don't know, 100 yards or so. Do you want us to um, walk down? Can you see up in there? Or, well, we can walk back this yeah. way anyway. Let's walk back that way. Is the uh, owner of that home there? Or? They're not. They're not. Okay. All right, well, let's swing that way then. <laughs> Yeah, um, so why doesn't that have the name Royal, I'll ask you at the hearing, yeah. but, but that's over that way then. It's the surface water, so surface water, surface protection area, it's generally take up the larger area, the ground water area. Okay, I've been freaking on that. Okay, <laughs> okay good. Um, all right, so we're right up in that area. Yeah, there. right where the... Property lines a little way up. What cutting? What, what cutting is proposed here? No, no the tree line will be as you see it today, close to out, man. Okay. Is there any uh, other like sound mitigation or anything else planned? No, um, we can talk about sound more when we get to the hearing, but generally the hotel is the least impactful part of the site for sound, and so um, that's part of the reason why it's located in this portion of the site. But while we're here, it might be good to get it in mind that where, where the event site is, we try to, in laying out the site, keep it away as, as far as possible from any of the existing residents, but also you have to imagine that 10-foot drop the continent there'll be a bit of a surround on it in addition to the in addition to the trees. I assume those trees will stay. Yes. Yeah. Look at the independent living from here. Yeah, and then the nursing home is you know so looks nice and warm. And drawing. Um Carries here. Does anyone yeah. else want to point out anything here at this point? Did you hear the interstate? To you? Just one yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. so is this all kind of during the winter time? Hotel it's plan? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's more or less level. I mean, you can kind of see how long the building is. So, pink stakes are the ends of the building. So, from there down to there. So, essentially, all around the hotel is more or less flat. Well, let's go back to the entrance and you can point out those trees a little bit more. Do you have the landscape architect here today? Or? Uh, the landscape architect's not here, but we can discuss the landscape. Okay, soon. good. And you have a little bit bigger blow up of that, I trust. Yeah, well, we're, we're ours are. And then if you look this way, in the, in the corner of the trees, you can see that flagging that's kind of tied to a branch there. Um, so in, in both of these, they, they sort of like, um, it's cut in towards the road still. So it's not like a straight cut back towards the road. This one is following the edge of the wetland buffer. And then this one is following the edge of the stream buffer. So it sort of curves around a little bit. But those are the units as they exist on the inside of the tree line. Let's go look at the street. So I just wanted to point this section out. There's a, there's a fair number of maps and things that show this area of the perennial stream. This was coming down the road right here. Um, so this is the area that when the fishing plow just uh, Brett, I lost his last name, um, came out, he's pretty sure that this is not a perennial stream here. So it comes down from the wetland area, um, comes to this culvert and this headwall, was across the road is in a, a I'm not sure what it looks like on the other side of the road to be honest with you, but that was also not considered a perennial stream until it crosses the road again down by that guardrail right back under the property. So we can go look for that green side. Way down by the green side? Yeah. And uh, yeah. The green sign the It's just it's maybe I can run down to it. Um, uh, or you, if you go, if you go up, 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 if you go up,
Yeah. I'll show you in a second. So I'll put on a few other things. But I just wanted to be here. It's not over there, it starts down there at the other end of that hall. And that's where you need to have a 50 foot pump. Yeah, yep, that's correct. That's correct. Which is all going to be within your free line. Oh, okay. Well, you go back up here and just show us a couple of blocks later with that. Um, but while we're here, that pavement uh, the, um, the orange flagging, that's the center of the drive line. Yeah, I was right there and there's the telephone pole so and this side of it yeah and in the back of those guy wires is uh here so the, the monument sign will be pretty much in between the pole and the back of those guy wires but on this side of it the sign the yeah yep. so these trees are coming down here then, right? those trees are coming down there yeah and those i mean those trees would need to come down for the driveway anyway yeah. um you know and then you can see most of that is staying. Some of that is coming down. The majority of those conifers are in the um, buffer. Well, so we're going to leave that. All the trees in the steam buffer are going to be left in the section of... The a, steam, you pointed out, if I understood correctly, the steam buffer doesn't... You, you said that green sign down there, didn't you? Uh, That's where the culprit's going in there. Oh, this one this on the right here. side. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it starts pretty quickly, almost right... Yeah, I mean, it's, the stream buffer um, essentially comes up to the end of the garden. Oh, I can see where it goes back across. Yeah, yeah. I got you. it comes okay. down by that drive, that private road. It yeah. comes across right yeah. there. Okay. Um, where that cone is pretty accurate, where the stream is cornered yeah. in with Route 66 yeah. and then along. Yeah. Um, so, we can, yeah, and we can go look at it. It's easy to just walk on the flat. Uh, 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 I'm Yeah. Oh, did it? Yeah, so the first one, we went to 750 feet wow. and got uh, 12 gallons in there. Oh. We need 26 and a half for the project. So and here you went out for? We were 165 feet and 150 gallons a minute. Wow. And, oh and I should point out while we're talking about it, that that well does not have sufficient yield to serve the project, right. and this one has way more right. than sufficient yield. So that the well that's on that side of the site is is not going to be used for right. the potable water system. Yeah. Yeah. So it's going to be heated entirely from this well. What are you doing with all the air? Yeah, we can't stop it. <laughs> Yeah, they didn't get their water from They got it from Rogers Road. Yeah. Did you get your name right? Oh, no, oh, no. Okay, well, you were, you were. No one needs to point out anything else. <laughs> we will head back. Yes. I'm sorry, I would like to um, just, um, the event tent, so my property up there has a gorgeous view to the west, which I'm mm, not sure if a high hotel will do anything but destroy the property value of that. Um, and the tent, so just while we're here though, I mean, I know we were up there, I don't want to make people walk up onto my property to see what it, the impact would be, it's just golden rain. Um, but having an event tent out there, there is noise that's going to be right next door. Um, well, the that's all. <coughs> see, I think we've seen pretty well what we need right. to see. Okay. You need to come to the hearing. Um, and, I'm going to be at the and, hearing. I just want, it's easier to visualize sure. up here, yeah. the proximity and, of where it is, that, that my property does the, you know, when you're standing up there where the hotel was, I pointed out then, the, the, the mowed area, the green area up there is, is a beautiful house site. Um, I, 
But, um, you know, the, the value of that, looking out over a hotel is different than looking out well, over... As I say, we will address all those issues, and you'll want to uh, be Except under criteria value. 8. That'll be what you'll want to... Um, and I think mm -hmm. we've seen it. We can. Um, I don't know if we go from here, but we could drive around and look. I don't think you can tell us your views. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think these are socked in. But I think we know the view pretty well. Yeah. Um, I only heard about this yesterday, and I know there are a number of people who couldn't be here today. So in terms of the hearing that is about to convene, is that the only opportunity people would have to participate and ultimately ask for intervention in this, or have the intervention deadlines already passed? If you could just yes. give us procedurally where we're at. Yes, well, pretty much. Well, yes to which one of those? <laughs> yeah, for all yes, of them. They need to be here today. It, it, a notice went out. It was noted in the Valley News and, and, and the Rutland, uh, and the Randolph right. paper did a story on it just last Thursday, so right. I don't see how they could have missed it, but, and nobody called me. And, and no, no, and, I, and I'm not, I was just trying to uh, yeah, they could have represent you, you could represent them if you wanted. So I, I have my own day of events that I've already oh, okay. right. But just so that, for example, the neighbor understands that she needs to speak and articulate her issues mm -hmm. at the hearing this yeah. afternoon yes. or this yes. morning yeah. and afternoon. You take good care of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. The commission listens quite carefully to what the neighbors concerns are. And then in terms of obtaining intervention or interested party status, is that something that needs to be filed by motion after today, after, today partici at the hearing? after participating, or today at the hearing? Okay, and are you verbally, no verbally is okay, you don't require okay. a written uh, uh, motion. But only today? Yeah. Oh, you can't make it today? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, let's head on down to uh, downtown. Yeah, very good. Or you can ask that question, and you can ask that question in in, uh, in ghetto. Good morning. Here we go. So we've just returned from a site visit uh, of the proposed hotel and convention center, and uh, we will now start the public hearing. Uh, this is Friday, October fourth, two thousand nineteen, and we are the District Three Environmental. Commission meeting at the Randolph Town Office. The application is seeking to construct an operatable propane. No, it's not. <laughs> That's what's on my script. Oh, I had to bring that. Up. <laughs> no, just joking. The applicant is seeking to construct. That's just a little inside joke. Um, two buildings: a 79-room hotel, three stories, 47,975 feet gross square feet, and an adjacent 152-seat restaurant. Um, 400 seat convention center, 14,739 square feet, with associated drive, parking, stormwater treatment, utilities, landscaping, and outdoor event space. The project is located on 25.9 acre parcel of land off Route 66, just uphill from exit 4, I-89, across from the park and ride. So I'm Tim Taylor, and I'm from Thetford. Uh, in Post Mills, and I'm the chair of the commission. I'll be presiding over the hearing. And to my right is Suzanne Butterfield, and she's from Stockbridge, and she's uh, one of the commissioners. And to my left is Rod McClay, and he's from South Stratford, not Stratford, South Stratford. And then further down is Linda Matson, and she is our coordinator, and all communications go to her, um, whether they're in writing. Um, or email, you know, whatever you talk with her, and uh, she will give you the answers that you need. Um, so what I'd like to do is start right here, and we'll do our introductions again, going around the room, and uh, and you might just mention, you know, who you are relative to. You, we don't need a big speech or anything; just who you are relative to the, the proceedings today. Thank you. I'm Steve Roy with Weeman Lampier Architects, uh, project architect for the buildings. Paul Ray, I'm one of the owners of the project. Tom Apple, I'm the owner's representative. Brian Lane Karnas, I'm the civil engineer for the project. Mm -hmm. Linda LaFrance, I'm a joining property owner. Mm -hmm. Sir? Oh, okay, you're in that yeah. row. Uh, my name's John Kelly, I'm a staff owner of the Herald Okay, thank you. Dave Rubin from the New Technical College. Anna Ray, Karen Colby, Paul's wife. Joan Sachs, landowner in Randolph Center. Nancy Rice, landowner in Randolph Center. 
Brooke Dingle, Dean. I'm an attorney who is entering my appearance today for Joan and for Nancy, as well as Exit 4 Open Space. Mm -hmm. Greg Bobo with the Natural Resources Board. Jen Mojo with the Agency of Natural Resources. Dwayne Shabbat, property owner, Jason. Paul Kendall, member of the Randolph Regional Re-Energize Task Force Group. Uh, could you just explain what that is? Sure. Um, about two years ago, uh, uh, Paul Costello and the, and the Rural Vermont Group uh, uh, initiated a process here, a, in, 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 uh, a process in town here, uh, to uh, have the general public participate in a series of conversations and, and discussions around ways to re-energize the, uh, the local region. Uh, and it covered quite a spectrum uh, of, of interests and activities, everything from parks uh, to, to culture and arts, to energy conservation, to uh, local redevelopment and, and, and so forth. Uh, and then we broke into uh, four different task forces to pursue a number of the specific suggestions that had, and concerns that had been raised through the uh, public uh, uh, hearings and discussions that, that we had held. Uh, one of those issues uh, had to do with this hotel and its relationship to uh, a concern that people had about having a downtown hotel facility. And it was in that regard that, that uh, I was participating uh, in the review of, of, of that aspect of the of the community's concern. Okay, thank you. Kind of like an ad hoc DRB. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Michael Penrod, I'm a town resident. Pete Fellows, Two Rivers Auto Quincy Regional Commission. Damian Dinicola, I'm uh, one of the co-chairs of the Randolph Region Reenergized uh, Economic uh, Development. Committee and Tourism Committee, which Paul Kendall just did a great job of explaining. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dan DeVoe, I'm a landowner, also a member of the Randolph uh, DRB. Oh, you're on the DRB? Yes, not here in any of your official capacity. Hi, Ari Rockman Miller, Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so, um, in just a second, the uh, um, Applicant will give us a general overview of the project, and uh, then we'll. Um, but I first wanted to just give you a little explanation about the process and how it works for some of you who aren't real familiar with this. Um, so uh, we're here, quasi-judicial capacity to collect evidence to see if this application uh, meets the standards of our law, Act 250, and. As you've seen with the green sheet going around, there's quite a few criteria, uh, some of which will be uh, of concern today and some of which won't. Um, and we'll address those of concern today. Um, and uh, so there, the, we may need additional information at some point, which we can ask for. Uh, but this is the start of the process. Um, I should say, really, the start of the process was when they filed their application and when our coordinator looked it over to see if it was complete or not. And uh, so if you want to participate in this process, um, there's a couple of good reasons for you to want to participate. Um, you get to, if you are deemed a party, then you get to introduce evidence, you get to cross-examine the parties, uh, the applicant and that, um, whatnot. Um, and uh, you can testify yourself. Um, and then if you're not, happy with our decision, um, you have the, uh, because you have a party status, then you can appeal it to the environmental court, where guess what? It starts all over again, from scratch, as if we didn't exist. Well, maybe we existed a little bit, but by and large as if we didn't exist, despite all our efforts. Um, you can note a little frustration there, <laughs> uh, but that's the way the law reads. Um, so anyhow, um, so it's pretty important um, if you want to participate today uh, to do that. Now, there's two types of parties that you should understand. There's what's called statutory parties, and um, this is decided by the legislature, and those are parties uh, by right, and they have an absolute right to participate, and that includes all the state agencies, that includes the town planning commission, includes the, the regional planning commission, um, obviously the applicant and whatnot. Uh, then there's the rest of us, and I say rest of us because we are just citizens like uh, many of you landowners, 
and uh, we have to show that we have a particularized interest that's above and beyond the, the general community, um, and that this affects us in some way. Um, and so that's what we will be doing now is to um, go be granting what's called preliminary party status. And after the uh, applicant gives us this little overview, you will have an opportunity to say who you are once again and address those issues that you want to have um, and say why you should be considered to be a party on a preliminary basis. Um, if you can't be and don't want to be a party and, and appeal, you can still help us out as a friend of the commission. And that doesn't allow you to go ahead forward and appeal our decision, but it does help uh, allow you to participate in some capacity with us. Um, so, um, with that being said, uh, would you like to give us just a quick brief overall? I think many of us were at the site visit, which I should add, Everything we mentioned and did at the site visit needs to be put on before once we convene the hearing. As we go through it, we need to get what we talked about at the site visit on uh, the record. I think what we'd like to do is start out with the sites. It's, it's fresh in everybody's mind, and I think most of the concern is going to be the site. So Brian can give us a quick overview of that and point out some of the things that we talked about. And we haven't convened the hearing yet, so um, we really just want to get the rough mm -hmm. idea of what it is you're doing, pretty much what I just spoken to in introducing you, and then we'll turn to the uh, neighbors and whatnot to get uh, okay. party status. So, so great. Um, so in case anyone wasn't at the site visit, uh, this is just a sort of vicinity map um, showing here's Route 89, uh, here's the V-Trans park and ride, uh, this is the former uh, Vermont Pure facility here. Um, this is the open field area where the proposed project will be located. Um, so the abutting landowners are here, 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 and here. Um, this uh, right here, and you can see this, this when this photo was taken, the Gifford uh, Independent Living Facility is under construction. So that's this sort of white building here. Um, Route 66 runs left to right, and Randolph Center is located over here. So that's a general overview of the, the project location. Um, here's an overall site plan um, that shows the majority of the project property. Um, so property lines are run along here. Um, there's a portion of the property over here that isn't shown, but we're not proposing to do uh, anything uh, on the west side of Oak Ridge Lane. So uh, this is the entrance, which is, uh, you can sort of see right here is the existing uh, farm drive that we were all came up at the site visit. Um, this building is the proposed hotel. Uh, this building is the restaurant and conference center. Um, this is the tent and event area, which we grassed. Um, there's a few other small outbuildings. There's a gazebo um, and the utility building here. Um, and so parking is, uh, there's a parking field in front and to the west and south of the building and then one to the east of the um, restaurant and conference center. And the stormwater treatment will be over here in the northwest portion of the site. That's, that's the real okay. brief one. Yep, yeah, no, that's good. Uh, I think that's good. Uh, well, let's start with, um, um, well, the first one on my list here is Linda La France, and um, you have written down here you would. Um, yeah, excuse me. Uh, needs to leave by ten thirty, so she's. Okay. Well, I'm just. Uh, we'll should take just a second here. I'm just taking them in order, so I don't get mixed up here. Um, you have. Um, my understanding is you live up on the hillside, right? That is you, sh you showed us the hillside. Mm -hmm. um, and you'd like to have um, your criteria of interest is three, seven, eight, and nine. Um, well, seven has already been taken care of um, at the town level, so we won't be doing seven. Mm -hmm. um, eight and nine are definitely of interest to you, from what I can see. And I'm, I'm not sure why necessarily three would be um, being uphill. Um, I believe that's um, water. Um, but um, is there any objection to granting 
um, granting party status to her on those. Um, yeah, do you have any objection no. to that? I have no objection. Which um, nine? Yeah. <laughs> do you know which nine you were referencing? We will be discussing 9B, um, which okay. is prime agricultural um, soils. Yes, okay. That's, there's probably a couple. Um, um, some, some is A as well, I think. Okay. What it'll bring to a com the community of Randolph Center. Okay. Um, Hmm? That's more of a general public issue. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we can talk some about yep. that. Um, good, all right, thank you. Um, would you like me to next? Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Um, Joan Sachs and Nancy Rice are individuals that seek party status in this matter, and I am here. Uh, representing them for purposes of today um, and will notify the Commission if I will be continuing to represent them and uh, I am also uh, here today entering my appearance on behalf of Exit for Open Space who um, similarly we will notify you if I will continue to represent their interests or if they will remain uh, as an interested party if they receive party status. Um, Joan, can you describe uh, where you're located in terms of your property? I am located on at 4142 Lamont Route 66, which is at the top of the hill. Uh, my property abuts the cemetery and uh, VTC. Can you point out which one that it's is? Not, it's, it's a little not far to the, to the right. It's not on that map. Oh, it's not on this map? No. It's probably a couple of miles away. A mile? It's about a mile and a half. mile and a half away. Yeah. Okay. Um, and how do you feel? Well, mm -hmm. my main interest, I mean, I, I will be affected by in terms of uh, traffic and so forth. That's a narrow road. I don't know if it will require to be widened or something because it's a narrow road, road on a curve. So and you drive by there. Is Pardon? You're saying, you're saying you I drive. I drive by there all the time. But my actual, my main interest, I mean, is far more fundamental. It's water. Um, the aquifer, I was part of a um, water first group that was concerned about Vermont Pure, as a matter of fact, taking a lot of water from our land. And my understanding is that the water that is sucked out of the ground for the, uh, for the project, 19,000 gallons a day was what was put in the paper last week, um, leaves the aquifer forever. It goes down the sewage and down to the sewage treatment plant, goes out to the river and down to the sea. It does not come back to, uh, to Randolph Center. And Randolph Center has had three large water-using projects built within the last five years. A nursing home, which is a big user of water, a, uh, an independent living, and a state lab. And I am concerned that my well will be drained from all of this. It's just, just you know, it's going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back. So I'm, I'm concerned about that most of all. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes. I, yeah. I mean, I'm also concerned about light pollution and so forth. But more fundamentally, the most fundamental thing is water. Um, uh, and Randolph has not had a... a uh, well, well I, I understand yeah. your concern. We'll get into the details yeah. of that and that criteria during the hearing. And I think I understand what, you know, why you want party status there. So um, that's good at this point. Um, so just in summary, she's asking for uh, standing on three, five, um, and eight. Nancy, could you describe um, to the District Commission where you're located? Um, I'm on South Randolph Road, 539 South Randolph Road, just past the PPC Orchard on the same side. And we have a well, and I'm concerned about the quantity of water available in the future uh, for the same reasons Jones was just speaking of. And I remember years ago when PPC was putting a swimming pool in, it, um, adjoining VPC, um, someone came around and pulled the pump out of our well when we weren't home, 
to check the water, and we had not given them permission. It's odd now that on something far bigger than that, we're not consulted. I mean, I'm not adjoining that, but Linda is, and our, our aquifer is underneath there, and I understand there's a large quantity of water that has been found with the second well, but I'm wondering how that affects the water supply for Randolph Center and people with wells around there. I also think that the road past there is potentially dangerous. Um, I often go down that road and it just seems like it's not, not appropriate. So I, my, if I understand correctly, you're off on that as well. I'm what? Uh, you're not located on this map either. Right, you go, you turn at the churches and you go down half a mile. So I'm taking the guess that it's about a mile as the crow flies. Turn at the churches. Um, I'm not as familiar. Sort of at the bottom. Where VTC. That's where you see it yeah, cutting off around the neighbor. Yeah. Yeah. Right there. Right here. So it's it should be down over here. Oh, okay. I live on the South Randolph Road myself. Down there. Okay. Thank you. So you're asking for, is that mm -hmm. correct? Three, five, and eight, is that what that would be correct? Yes, that is correct. And then lastly, um, on behalf of Exit 4, as you may recall, uh, it was a grassroots citizens group that coalesced um, for the exit for a proposal by Mr. Samus two years ago um, to turn that into uh, a variety of things. But um, you may recall that Mr. Samus and um, Exit 4 and others reached an agreement so that the property was able to be conserved um, by um, the Hoopers, as well as by Exit 4 raising a million dollars to be able to acquire the 22-acre portion that was of most concern, which is right across from uh, McDonald's. And as you may have noticed, driving into town, we now have the amazing um, Jim Sardonis' new uh, whale dance um, figures there. I have not come home from a from one day in Barrie where my office is without seeing a number of people at that location taking pictures for uh, the yearbook and enjoying those amazing whale tails. That is conserved land now, and um, there are a number of people within the exit who are very concerned about light pollu pollution from this um, proposal, particularly because it exceeded it exceeds the height restriction. In the, zoning, um, in the zoning ordinance. I understand that there is some sort of waiver that was imposed that allowed them to go higher, but if it's higher, there's more potential for light pollution. So there is a concern on number eight, and they would seek party status um, because they think the interest in ensuring that those amazing views uh, remain uh, able to be um, enjoyed and that the area does not, um, is not burdened by undue adverse air um, light during the night sky is very important to those folks. In addition, they are also concerned uh, for the traffic in the areas. Many of them travel daily back and forth um, and want to ensure that there are conditions that are protective of the traveling public. And there are also a number of folks that similarly have uh, wells in the area, so to ensure there's no ad undue adverse impact to the existing water supply. So we would seek uh, party set up status for exit for open space on three, five, and eight. Um, are there objections from you all at this point, or anything you want to comment on or talk about the perspective? Do you, do you I just mention something? They weren't at the local DRB mm -hmm. hearing. Well, that's. I um, mean, they're just sort of showing up now, and nobody. Yeah. Has spoken to me. Um, yeah. um, Excuse me, I wasn't. You were, yes, but not yeah. the open space and I group. Did speak about yeah. the same yes. issue. Well, I'm talking about open space that she so just. So, you intend to leave, though, right? So, who's going to be here to participate for exit four? Um, I was notified 
as I told you at the site visit yesterday about this. So are you only holding one hearing on this? I, I don't I don't know, but um, I mean we, we, this has been properly noticed. Yeah, and, and I don't want to get yeah. into a debate, of it, the debate yeah. about that. I have an 11 o'clock appointment, yeah. and I can come back and try to participate as best I can on their behalf. Um, well, I mean, so, um, but that I, should, I, that shouldn't, I hadn't that shouldn't expected alter. exit four here either, and um, we will need to do some research on this because, um, as you probably well know, a party status for a group has the uh, latitude for that has been narrowed, and you need to have participants and individuals and individual names that are part of that group, and they need to be represented and be here, I believe. And uh, uh, so um, I'm not sure, <laughs> you know, who is part of that group who is here today um, to participate. Um, are any of the neighbors <coughs> members of that group? Well, you're, I think you're getting a little ahead of yourself because well, you're the question the first. Well, party status, and one of the issues in that is participation, usually in order to get final party status. So. Okay, but we're t dealing with preliminary. It's a request. I think yeah. you're, it's incumbent upon you to determine in first instance, A, is there an objection to it? Before, uh, you're, we're not at the hearing yet, and just make your determination. If you're going to deny um, a group to have party status, um, Nancy and Joan are members of Exit 4, but they are also here representing their own personal interests. Okay, so that's what I'm trying to get, get an understanding of, is are there members of Exit 4 here today? Yes, there are. Okay. So whether I come or go, and then back later, I will try to help the best that I can. Uh, but that shouldn't have anything to do with your determination as to whether or not they should um, have party status or not. Whether they then participate is sort of a second step, and if they are granted preliminary party status and then fail to participate uh, in questioning, I don't think there's any obligation that they cross-examine people or even that they present evidence. They can make legal argument. They, there's no laundry list of requirements that they do that they give you proposed findings or any of the other aspects of representation. Okay. I don't mean to cut you off, but we have members from Exit 4 here. That's what I need to find out. Um, that's good. Are there, did you, um, do we have other okay. folks? Can we just go, go back? So we didn't really get a chance no, to No, no, we'll, 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 okay. we got, I want to gather everybody here and then we'll let you think about this for a while. Um, sir, um, you, did you, uh, uh, Let's see, you're Mr. Wayne Shabbat. Yeah, Shabbat. Are you part of the Exit 4 group? Uh, I really didn't know about the group too much, so no, not yet. Okay, so, but you're asking for party status on 5, 3, 5, and 8. And, yes. And if I understand correctly, let's try to point. To, I'm yeah, just, my house is right there. So you're in a butter. Yes. Um, so that's really all I need from you. <laughs> Um, I will, for the record, point out that he's in a butter. Uh, he's a little uphill from the project. The project affects him from behind. He's relatively near the. Um, and my road goes right beside it. Yeah, yeah this is the, the, the uh, private road, sheer right of way. There's a lot there. Yeah. Do um, we have any other neighbors here that I've. Uh, I see Dan DeVoe. Um, it says resident. Okay, you don't have any criteria down. Yeah, DRV. Yeah. Have I covered everybody then who wants party status as a, with a particularized interest? Okay. Well, we're going to listen to you folks say what you want to say about that. Relative party status. Yeah, relative party um, status. So I'm, uh, I'm not claiming to make a decision for the owners about whether they object or not, but uh, I, I'm not sure, particularly for the two ladies from Randolph Center who live more than a mile away from the project, whether that really demonstrates a particular right of interest under traffic, which they'll have no more impact than anyone else in the general public who drives by the site. Um, <clears throat> water supply, um, Whereas there's uh, you know a significant process from the state to uh, ensure that the proposed water supply won't be uh, unduly affecting uh, adjacent water supplies, and the based on the amount of withdrawal that's proposed for the hotel, 
the radius of investigation for interference into uh, other water supplies from the proposed water supply for the hotel and, and uh, the rest of the project is 2,000 feet. Um, so we've notified everyone within that 2,000 foot. Good, let's hold all that for when we discuss mm -hmm. that criteria, sure. okay? And then um, on the exit four group, um, mm -hmm. I, I'm less familiar with how things work uh, in terms of uh, getting party status for a group, but I, I'm curious to hear how we establish um, who is or isn't a member of the group and, and who is authorized to represent the group as a whole in, the, in this uh, discussion. Yeah. Yeah. I would, um, um, our general counsel, you can come out at the recess with <laughs> us, can't you? Good, I thought so. We'll, we'll, we'll avail ourselves of having the general counsel here. So you understand he's, um, he may want to introduce himself better than I would, but he's our chief legal expert for the Natural Resources Board. And when we have legal issues or questions, we turn to him for his wisdom and understanding of the law. So we will, um, unless you have something else on I think they're just okay. because we're a little shocked that open space yeah, would show up when they haven't been involved at all. Yeah, no, no one's yeah. contacted me or um, uh, the first thing we've heard about it this morning. Yeah. And it's okay, a little well, disheartening gonna, to be honest. We're gonna recess and uh, go discuss this and if general counsel wants to come with us, that'd be great. Mr. Taylor, can I just say one other thing on behalf of uh, the entry of uh, exit four? Um, because this is I just want the applicant to know that um, the people are concerned about some particular issues. This isn't some kind of uh, gauntlet that's being thrown to try to um, create difficulty for the applicant or to try to uh, um, you know, cause this, this project to be denied. <coughs> These are just issues that we want to ensure are taken care of if there are wells in the area that may be at risk, um, like the pike quarries, uh, the pike quarry in Williamstown, one of the resolutions there was to promise to drill a well deeper and to ensure that the water supply did not, was not diminished. No, I, so, I think we understand that. Well, I yeah. understand um, this is last minute in terms of any informal conversations previously. Um, we just want to ensure that uh, the folks that are do have a particularized interest are protected through the process. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We'll do that shortly. Mm -hmm. well, that's here. Um, let's see. So, um, Joan Sachs. Yes. We are granting party status, preliminary party status, on 3, 5, 8, and 8. Nancy Rice on 3, 5, and 8. Linda LaFrance on 3, 5, and, well, I assume, no, no she, could, she wants 8. And 9B, which we'll be discussing anyway. We have to discuss that ourselves. Um, Wayne? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Your vote? Um, 3, 5, and 8. And exit 4, open space on 3, 5, and 8. And just understand this is preliminary party status. I, I should mention that um, were we not to do this, um, they could take an immediate appeal <laughs> from our decision. Um, so it's better, usually from our applicant's point of view, to let them have their say. Uh, which is good because it's an open, it's an open forum. We think we can adequately address their concerns. Good. Um, so um, now I give uh, an oath to you all who might be testified. And uh, do you solemnly affirm the evidence that you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? Yes. Thank you. The hearing is now convened. Uh, the application was ori originally submitted on August 30th, 2019. The application documents and any documents submitted since then have been posted on the public database. 
And if you need help locating that database, the lender's more than willing to help you through that. Um, we've reviewed the application and determined that we will take evidence and it is expanded um, on basically one. Um, we'll be taking evidence from um, 1A, 2, and 3, headwaters, uh, water supplies, 1E streams, 1G wetlands, um, and then three, well, I mentioned three already, water source and wells, um, five, traffic, safety, and eight, aesthetics, and nine, B, um, uh, uh, prime agricultural soils, uh, and then 10, insofar as it relates to uh, the regional commission. Um, in Randolph, uh, they are in what we call an Act 250 town, I guess you would say, and uh, criteria, I believe it's six, seven, and ten, and ten have, as it relates to the town, have been already uh, litigated in effect. Okay, so what we do now is um, we're going to let the applicant go ahead and proceed. Um, we're going to direct ourselves uh, in case Jen has to leave early. Um, she doesn't, but uh, we'll start down in the ones anyway, because that's simpler. And then we might actually jump up to the eights, um, up to eight. Um, but um, we can pretty much proceed as you, as you all want to do. That's fine. So what happens is they give their presentation. Uh, we'll be speaking to the particular criteria as we go along. And uh, we'll be addressing them and then we'll offer you an opportunity to address them too as well. Okay? So, now we're on the record. Thank you. Finally. Yeah. So if we um, could pick up uh, on the site and just real quickly go through that, we'd like to sure. present that material to you. And then the um, building elevations so that people can um, begin to visualize the, the massing and, and so forth of what we're proposing and and keep it to that and then go on in with the criteria. We've got, we certainly have plenty of other materials to, that we can bring up uh, when we get your questions and the public's questions. Okay. Okay, so, do you have anything else to finish up on? Uh, I mean, I think we have covered this site um, relatively well. One thing I did want to mention was uh, relative to the site is that the, the stakes we were looking at for the tree clearing were located here and here. So I was trying to describe there um, that the, the angle of the end of the clearing angles in as it goes over towards the road. So um, visually from the road, the amount of tree clearing will be a bit less than what it looks like from the inside of the site um, because these two areas are um, you know, angling in towards the road. So, um, just if I get back, so we're talking about up on the entryway to the left and to the right. Yep, yep. So the, the this sort of dark line uh, here is the limit of tree clearing in those areas. Um, and so the stake we're looking at is here, and then here is the culvert, uh, and where it comes across from 66. So that it's angled in, I don't know, roughly 45 degrees to the front of the tree line. Um, both on the left and the right of the driveway. Okay, and Jen, um, in the state and whatnot, you get a little special treatment here. So if you need to pipe up and ask questions, please do. Okay? Uh, thank you. Well, um, otherwise, unless there's any specific questions about the, the layout of the site at this time, um, we can move on to that. Where's the drill well right uh, the, the drill well that we're going to serve the project from is located roughly there along the tree line. So there was, a, we did see there's a second drill well um, back at this end of the site. Um, that well didn't have adequate capacity. So we had done that one first at the south end of the site. And um, as Paul was mentioning at the, uh, the site walk through, the, the, the first well only had a driller to give us 12 gallons per minute, which was inadequate to serve the needs of the development. So we drilled the second well. Um, which isn't unusual when you're doing exploratory uh, well drilling for, to support a public water system. Um, the second well has a drillage yield of 150 gallons a minute, which is about five times the um, rate that we need to, to support the project. So 
only the only the second well at the north end of the site here uh, we're going to propose to use to serve the portable water needs of the project. Is that what you would call a true artesian? Um, so they're both artesian wells. Um, really, all artesian means is that the aquifer that you're using is pressurized, and so if if you picture um, this sort of you've seen the, the sort of U tube. So it's like a U-shaped glass tube, and the water level goes evenly. So if there's pressure down in the watershed, uh, water aquifer, um, it just the water level rises up to the to equal out the amount of pressure that's in there. It's, it isn't really particularly indicative of the amount of water we can withdraw from the well, whether the well happens to be in our teaching aquifer or not. It's more indicative of the fact that there's a um, restrictive layer that water can't move through between the surface and the um, aquifer that you're actually withdrawing water from. We'll get into that a little more later. Um, okay, so is that... That's generally the site, and like I said, unless there are specific questions on the layout, the general layout of the site, we can move on to the building uh, design. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's, let's do that, that for now. Steve, do you want to go to the SketchUp model first, or...? Uh, yeah, the bottom left corner. Do you want to flip through the slides? Like yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is uh, an image essentially from the point where Brian was standing earlier with the red flag at the bottom of the street. Uh, so looking up the driveway, um, there's a monument sign uh, to the west side of the driveway. The landscape architect has proposed uh, a split rail type agrarian fence uh, and some uh, cabinet <coughs> trees along the entrance side. Uh, look, looking up, this is the hotel building. It's three stories. Uh, this is the main entrance and Fort Bocher area that is kind of partially hidden by the grade. This would be the restaurant and conference center building uh, on the left as you enter the space. A little bit further uh, into the site, this is approximately where people were parking um, for today's visit. Um, from there, uh, we were looking to the left at the the corner, the flags that were in the corners of the building, uh, as well as the hotel corners that would be over here and here. Uh, the path was essentially cutting through this area. Uh, this is kind of a bird's eye perspective, uh, looking from above the parking lot towards the conference center building. Uh, this portion here on the left is the restaurant portion. We've tried to really break down the massing um, using uh, gables and porch elements to help make it feel like a, a series of smaller buildings as opposed to a large building. This, uh, this would be the main entrance, so taking left into the restaurant or right uh, into the conference center, this would be the, um, the indoor event space which has a capacity of about 400 people. Uh, and this is the corner of the hotel as seen from the front. And the images we're seeing here, are they um, uh, for us to, uh, are they, in other words, will there be that kind of planting? We'll, I know we'll go through a planting diagram at some point, but just so that we kind of visualize this as we see it now. Yeah. Um, is that the kind of thing that you're proposing to have in the middle and, the, and whatnot, or is that just to make us feel good? Be, uh, this is done a little bit in tandem with the landscape plan. Yeah. Uh, it may not be 100% accurate given the types of plants that are available, and uh, it's somewhat representative, and the landscape plan should be used as a final determination. Uh, but in general, tree locations, et cetera, are, are meant to be pretty accurate. Okay. Um, so uh, what we're looking at here is the hotel itself. Um, it's three stories high. We've uh, kind of broken it up with some of the similar um, gable elements that we've that we've used on the conference center building. Um, we have uh, all of the siding materials I have as samples if anybody's interested in looking at those closer. These are um, a stone, a manufactured stone material on the first level uh, and horizontal and vertical siding uh, clockwork type products that will be used. And we brought the stone up uh, along the center as well. And I might just point out while you're sort of getting your head wrapped around how the hotel looks, we, um, the, the product owners, uh, requested uh, special permission from the national franchise that uh, it's going to be a Hampton Inn, so um, Hilton is the 
national franchise owner, um, they requested special permission to deviate from the standard look uh, of a Hampton Inn. So the way that they usually build these, um, this would be a four-story hotel. They would have a flat roof. Um, the color scheme would be white and light gray and blue, um, and it would be um, metal panels with um, like a stucco finish. And it would be designed probably. Well, so, and that's, that's what I'm saying is that um, during the design process, the, the owners were um, trying to be sensitive to the local architectural vernacular yes. and then also just the, the setting of the thing. So that's the color selection being an earth tone color selection using materials that look more like a typical wood siding or stone. Um, on the material were all intentional things that were done to try and improve the aesthetics of uh, what this hotel would have been if the, the national brand had come in and just built their standard. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We did go in front of the design review committee too, but the time was a draft yeah. board, and they all supported this concept yeah. of a peak roof, not a flat roof, and the fitting of the landscape. So. One one of the other points too on the landscaping and the direction to the architect or the landscape architect um, was it, we wanted to avoid having too many medium to tall uh, plants, plantings and trees and so forth. Uh, and you see how what she's done on that, and it, it allows for even at maturity to have uh, it became a security issue. So you've got line of sight instead of creating after 10 years, dark areas or hidden areas uh, around the parking area. So that's why this is uh, one of the design elements that we had in it. Okay, thank you. Uh, again, just some, this one's more of an eye level uh, view looking towards the hotel. Uh, again, trying, trying to kind of minimize, there are several steps of the building. Uh, both uh, horizontally and vertically within the roof, uh, just to help kind of bring down the scale and get a little bit less obtrusive to the environment. Uh, and a, kind of a look as if you were going to be entering into the Fort Crochet area at the entrance. In the background, uh, shows the scale of the conference center and restaurant to the left. That's it. Okay. Okay. Yep. Well, let's um, let's focus on some criteria now, um, and let's start down with um, uh, the agency of natural resources uh, concerns, um, and maybe uh, Jen, you should speak to those, um, introduce yourself, and, and we can have a conversation back and forth about them. I'm Jen Mojo with the agency of natural resources. I work in their office of planning and our office of coordinates the review. Room. Active duty applications amongst the agency's three departments. So, uh, the comments that I submitted to the commission yesterday are the comments from our staff who are reviewing the, the project in the context of whatever their um, permitting scheme may be or um, under the different active duty criteria. Uh, the comments I provided yesterday, um, I received a comment from Laura Riker, who's in the division, um, the agency's drinking water and groundwater protection division. And the program is seeking additional information um, regarding uh, storage of hazardous types of materials and potential sources of contamination with respect to the project's location in uh, the Royalton uh, surface water protection area. So um, as mentioned at the site visit, it was surprising that this is actually within Royalton's district um, surface water protection areas. Uh, uh, surface water source protection areas, excuse me, tend to be larger than uh, your typical groundwater source protection area. So the program is seeking additional information that acknowledges the, the location within this spa source protection area um, and supplemental information about what are the potential sources of contamination. And I'm happy to provide um, an additional fact sheet to the commission which outlines what uh, the different zones represent. So zone one of the spa is the actual source in a 200 foot radius, and then zone two um, for surface water sort of protection area is 200 feet within any perennial um, 
surface water, and then zone three is the area beyond that 200 feet. So um, the project is within zones two and three. Um, and uh, Laura within the program is available to review the supplemental information and provide comments. But at this time, we're not requesting any additional conditions, just acknowledge that that of, of the project's location within the spot and understanding where what different materials are stored here. Okay. And then under criteria two and three, my understanding is that um, they are, the project is still uh, pursuing the source permit. Um, and as discussed at the site visit, there was two sources, um, one, one which doesn't have sufficient yield, and that's currently being reviewed by uh, the division. So if there's additional questions, which I assume there may be, given the uh, articulated concerns. Um, I'm not the expert for the program, but if the commission has uh, additional questions for the division, those can be included in the recess order and by the permitting program. Mm -hmm. Well, um, also 1E streams was a concern, too. Right. Um, but, and that was, um, if you want to bring back that picture that shows the uh, stream yeah the stream and I think we've put that adequately on record if I have but yeah I just want to mention your undisturbed area where that yeah so this is, this is probably the best sort of overall picture of it um, as we discussed at the site visit there's a number of maps that show a perennial stream that just runs all along the uh, south side of route 66 to this class, identified class 2 wetland um, the visit with the fisheries biologist um, identified this as what is essentially a roadside ditch along Route 66 here, which winds the stone and then goes into a culvert to the other side of Route 66 and then back under another culvert onto the project property. Um, only identified the stream as perennial starting from the culvert where it returns to the property uh, over on the west side. So. Um, based on my conversation with fisheries biologists, we're showing a 50-foot buffer from um, essentially what is the, the bottom of the bank right adjacent to the stream. Um, so this, this, these two dark lines are illustrating that bottom of the bank there. Um, and then this lighter line, which is a little hard to see, but this is the 50-foot buffer. A uh, significant portion of which is actually contains Route 66 right here on the north side. Um, but we are uh, limiting the disturbance of the project to be outside of the 50-foot buffer as shown. With possible section, of, it's really hard to see on this plan, so let me pull up a different one. So again, here's, here's the culvert, and then here's the beginning of the stream. Here's the edge of the buffer and the tree clearing. Um, so right now there's an existing sewer manhole for the municipal sewer system. Um, so that's where we're planning to make our sewer connection. So there may be a little bit of temporary disturbance just in the edge of the 50-foot buffer to allow us to connect to this manhole at this location. Um, but certainly once that's done, um, that could return to being an unmanaged area unless something happens with the sewer line and needs to be repaired. Uh, what are you doing to uh, make sure that that does remain undisturbed? Um, well, I'm sure the applicant would be happy to accept a commission. Uh, condition from the commission um, to maintain the 50 foot buffer as undisturbed area, but um, generally the, the way it's going to remain undisturbed is by not clearing the trees. And, so it, and visually we saw that, that it is in fact grown up to trees right now. Yeah, right they're, they're quite tall, yes. Yeah. yeah, so it'll be it'll be clear by the limit of the trees where the edge of the buffer it's is. It's not exactly something that I, you can have the mow and continue to mow closer. No, you have a, yeah, and beyond the fact that the mowed area, the proposed managed area for the hotel really ends shortly outside of the parking um, because of the way the landscaping was designed. One of the, um, the landscaping was really designed um, based on a very specific set of local criteria that are part of the specific zoning district that it was you know, implemented around the interchange, the interstate interchange. Um, and one of the things was trying to maintain as much as possible the sense of the agrarian character. So a lot of the open areas that are outside of the parking um, and outside of the area that we need for snow storage and maintenance and utilities are um, going to be meadow areas anyway and not really intensely managed like the lawn. Okay. Um, 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 besides the fact that there's also quite a large uh, slope that's going to be created along this north side of the parking here that's really going to prevent 
the creep of that mode area towards the towards the river along there. Um, I think that covers that. Um, the wetlands, um, delineation and whatnot. Um, just wanted to touch on that if we could. That's if you can tell us, yes, I'm please. happy to address yeah. it. So um, I'll have a site visit with, was it Shannon? Or Shannon Morrison um, to review the, the wetlands was delineated by Arrowwood Environmental uh, last fall before we really got going on the, on the project design. So um, Shannon reviewed the wetlands delineation um, and agreed with what Arrowwood's work. Um, she walked around the rest of the site with Paul and, and didn't identify any other wetland areas that needed to be protected. So, Essentially, we are uh, limiting our disturbance to the 50-foot wetland buffer. Um, I know that because some of the disturbance is kind of close to it, she requested a condition that we mark out the buffer in the field before construction, and we're more than happy to do that. So uh, on this plan, um, this darker line is the delineated wetland, and that was surveyed. The flags were surveyed when we did our, our site surveys, so it's quite an accurate location. And then again, this, this outer line here is the limit of the 50-foot buffer right along there. Okay, now this shows with the squiggles that you have some wooded area there, but I don't, that's, or am I wrong? That's existing, that? existing wooded area, so we'll leave the trees within a 50 foot buffer. Okay, and right in? In this area, that right area here. There. Yep. And so there, the, the existing, it's not shown on this plan, <coughs> it's shown on this plan. The existing trees, that was the corner of the trees we were looking at, where mm -hmm. that flagging was. So there'll be this along the uh, edge of the buffer here. These trees will be maintained, and then to the east of the, or sorry, west of the buffer is where we're planning to put them for the driveway area. Okay. So we got trees on that buffer too. Yes. Yep. And they're all all so the trees on the site are, are quite yeah. mature and easy to see. So coming downhill from Route 66, you won't see that to the left. You'll uh, see the building. There is a portion, and we can we have a, um, a viewshed study that we'll go over when we get to Criterion 8, probably. Um, there is a place you can see the project on Route 66, but generally, um, you don't see it. You see it from, well, we can go over it, because it, it's more illustrative if we can show you the pictures while we're talking about it. So the, the wetland, just following that back, the wiggle the way that wiggles, starting up top. If you, yeah. Here? So yeah. the wetland is sort of right along the Route 66 right way here. Yeah. And then it cuts back to the southeast along this line, it sort of noses out here, and then so the, it, there's more wetland to the east here, but we're not showing it because we delineated it along the edge where we're having the closest disturbance. Mm -hmm. But now you round circles right there. Are those trees going in or coming out? These or? are existing trees. Yeah, yep. that are staying there. Yep. Those are all staying okay. there. Yep. And, but we're still in the wetland there. I mean, just buffer. on the edge of it, the buffer. Yes, fifty foot buffer. Yeah, yeah. And um, again, we kind of down in the lower corner there. We kind of lo lose. Yeah, just to your right, a little more. Here. Yeah, right there where it says wooded there. Yep. Now we're no longer in the wetland. We're just outside. You're outside the buffer, even. Yeah. The buffer. The wetland and the buffer. So yeah, the corner of the existing tree line there is outside the wetland buffer. By the time you get down that far south, has some of that been chopped already? Or no, not in that area. Kind of back in that. Cause, all right. So the, the tree line, as you see it here, is the, exactly the same as what you saw on the site that the site was today. Oh, despite the bronze source. Well, whatever chopped <laughs> up all that. I oh yeah. So the, the source, area so that you saw was a lot of that area off. was. Um, Less like brushier stuff yeah. that was really done so oh, okay. uh, for the property before we were started to do our exploratory and stuff like that. So, all right, all right, good, okay, very good. I think could I, could I ask you on the um, condition that's proposed? Mm -hmm. And we assume that that's going to be condition that mm -hmm. language. Yeah, thank you. It helps with the contractor because then we can put that in the plans. And it's easier to manage the uh, construction when it comes from active. Oh, you'd like to see it on the plans themselves. I'll put them on the plans if it's yeah. in the permit. Mm -hmm. okay. Very good. I did mention um, to Shannon that you know I would manage you know putting up the soap fence, make sure it's in the right spot, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Not allow you know contractors or anybody to touch in that fifty foot buffer. So I'm taking that responsibility to make sure. It's done correctly. I'm the one who matters. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Um, 
Okay, um, let's jump to criteria eight, which I know is. Okay. Can I just yeah, back up and address sure. the comments on the source protection area? Um, so well, we'll come. We're definitely coming back to oh, okay. criteria three. Yeah. Oh, so you'll you'll even okay. Yeah. We'll just yeah. I just want to get you know while people are still not falling asleep yet and whatnot. And I know that's yes. Uh, can we do uh, Criterion 10 real quick? In sure, like yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the Regional Commission feels that it conforms with the Regional Plan, so we're all set there. I did have one general question to the applicant about the access and their access permit for DTRANS. Do they plan any what, shoulder widening or um, any slip lanes or anything like that? You know, there's no traffic improvements proposed. We did have a traffic study done, and DTRANS had a chance to review it, so it didn't meet any of the criteria thresholds for widening or turning lanes or anything. We will discuss that further. Yeah. Okay. We can, we can go over all That's that. all I have. Okay. Thank right. you. Right. Uh, let's go to eight then and uh, start talking about um, all the issues that come with um, potentially eight with respect to noise, light. Uh, aesthetics, does it fit, um, that kind of thing, and this is where <coughs> we would expect to see participation from the neighbors and members of Exit 4 and that kind of thing. Sure. Um, so uh, let's start with the uh, view study because I think that's actually really helpful to understand how the project fits in the context of the area generally. So um, this view study was actually a, a requirement that the, uh, the local zoning regulations have for the, like I said, again, the special zoning district that they have at the interstate interchange. Um, so this, this was aimed at both is illustrating the uh, visibility of the project and also satisfying the requirements uh, for the town uh, zoning process. And um, just to get this on the record, I'm sure everyone is probably already aware, but the, the project has already been approved by the Randolph DRB, so they've um, been through all of these uh, visibility and, and criteria themselves and, and found the project to uh, conform with their regulations. So uh, what we did was um, we flew uh, a set of three balloons uh, right at the main entrance to the hotel. So um, I realize this is upside down from the rest of the views we've looked at today, so just to orient everybody, here's 89, here's the park and ride, here's the entrance where we came in, hotel and conference center. Um, so right at the main entrance to the hotel, uh, we flew a series of three balloons. Um, the first balloon was at 50 feet, which is roughly the, the highest height of the hotel, um, right at the peak of that gable that's over the uh, entrance there that you saw when we were looking at the, the um, elevation views. Um, then we flew a, a second balloon at 75 feet and a third balloon at 100 feet, just to get an idea of how tall something would have to be before you'd have to see it from various vantage points. Um, and then um, drove around to different spots to see where you could see the balloons from. Um, so there were uh, one perspective for was from down here uh, at the general area where the Samus project was previously proposed, right across the street from the McDonald's. Um, so you can get a sense of what you can see um, from this conserved land down here. Um, both of the interstate uh, off ramps to get a sense of whether the product will be visible from the interstate or not. Um, here at the park and ride, and then from a couple of vantage points up the hill. Um, this is right on Route 66, so this is the wetland area right here. So this is looking across the wetland area. Um, this is from the independent living facility, which isn't shown, wasn't built yet on this overhead photo, but it, that's where that photo was taken. And then another vantage point further up 66 um, to illustrate views as you get up closer to Randolph Center. You don't have one from Ms. LaFrance's? We don't, but we can discuss that as we go through okay. these, uh, these views. So starting from, starting from the uh, independent living facility, um, and just before we look at this, I just wanted to point out relative to LaFrance property. Um, so these are, I think these are 20 foot contours on this one. Uh, but you can see that this is the mode area here uh, where Ms. France was uh, telling us that she's proposing to construct a residence. Uh, and if you follow the contour, it kind of um, goes along here and right, this is the same contour that runs right along the edge of the uh, independent living facility. So this is where we took the picture from. Essentially the same elevation um, as the France property. Just to point that out before we start there. Oops. 
but further back. Uh, just from a different perspective, I mean, essentially the same distance from the project between here and there. I mean, if you're thinking of like a circle from the projects, they're mm -hmm. roughly the same distance away. So this is the view, this is the end of the independent living facility. Um, and so this, these are the three balloons. So this yellow balloon here is the one that actually represents the, the height of the building. Um, yeah, thanks. You not see my, yeah, so there's a blow up of the three balloons, you can see them, but this is where it is in the picture. Um, and then so what um, Steve and, and his folks did was that they took the model of the hotel, three-dimensional model of the hotel, they placed it in this picture using the actual height of this balloon to place where the top of the roof line is. So here's the same view with the, with the hotel placed in it. Um, so this is the back of the conference center. This here is the roof line of the hotel, so you can see can the couple steps. Can we bring down the lights a little bit if possible? I don't know if that's, I think maybe behind you in the hallway there, Tom. Just back. Okay. Yeah, flip, try the other one, and if you could flip that the other way around, it might be better. Oh, there you go. Yeah, that's that's good, I think. Yeah. So I knew Greg would be. Yeah, there you go. Small. <laughs> so so again, um, this right here is the back of the. Here's the conference center. Here's the restaurant. Uh, and then this is the hotel going sort of away from you. So you can see the couple of steps in the roof lines. The highest point of the roof line is right there. Um, so you can see that you'll see it from here, um, but it's not interrupting the views. So right here is the top of the existing tree line that's to the west and downhill from the project. So all of those pine trees that you see along here <coughs> and along here, those are the same trees you can see right here in this picture. So while the hotel is 50 feet tall, it's not taller than the existing tree line that's beyond it in the view. So from this point, yes, you can see the hotel. I mean, I think it's reasonable to assume that if you build something, you can see it from somewhere. Um, but it's not interrupting what most people would consider the view, which would be the view of the hills, foothills and mountains beyond the project. Um, so we would expect that that relationship between the building and the tree line would be very similar at the LaFrance property as it would be for Morgan Orchard because it's at the same elevation. Regardless of the angle that you're looking at the project from, if you're at the same elevation, the height relationship between the roof line of the building and the height of the trees beyond will be the same if you're at the same elevation. Um, okay, Linda? Yes. Is that okay call you Linda? Uh, yes, my name. Lots of people call me that. <laughs> Me too. Um, so, um, is can can we see your property here to the left there? Is that... uh, you can see part of um, on the left yeah, down, be... just you know, kind of above the A is sort of a yeah. lower part of it. Um, it continues to roll up, and there's a hill. So you, you can see that tree line kind of heads up, and so there's a, a top of a, a hill up there. But when you get beyond the trees. Um, kind of here in the foreground that are around a wet area, there's a lot more open space. I tried pointing that out today yeah. while we were up there, that there's a more of an open space and a direct line of sight that would go right over the top of the, or, or right into the top of the hotel. Again, I think you're, you're referring to this area up here, right? Yes, and, and yeah. just the angle down. So what you can see from over here in that picture is kind of this part of the hill. Um, but again, if you if you look at these, it's a little hard to see on here, but this elevation contour goes like this. So the elevation here is essentially the same as the elevation at the, uh, where that picture is taken from. So the picture is taken from right where that cursor is sitting right now. But you don't have any trees blocking your view down it's that like way right. in the field. Right. It looked like we could look right you, up. Right, you can straight look straight down. There. And there are the two big trees that are planning on coming down where the party tent's going to be. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that, that I find very objectionable from, from the aesthetics point of view. Okay. If you want to move around some more? Yep. So, um, 
This is the view from Route 66. Um, so the, the project drive, you can see this car sitting right here. That's about where the project drive is, and then this is the existing wood line, and then the, where you're adjacent to the large wetland, it's, it's pretty open there. So again, here's the, the balloons that were flown, yellow representing the actual top of the hotel. Um, so there will be a, a um, when you're driving by the wetland on Route 66 from the north, you will be able to see the project from there. Um, one of the things that's not shown well on this rendering uh, is that in what came out of the, um, the local hearing is we added some additional um, trees along this back of the hotel here to sort of break up that um, long wall that you'll be able to see. But um, again, if you go back to where this picture is taken from, so you can see you're sitting right here um, and you're looking over the wetland. So that's a very brief view for travelers that are going along Route 66. Um, and then let me just skip down. This is, this is the view looking towards the project from a little bit further up the hill. Um, so this right here is the drive to Morgan Orchard, so it's just up the hill from there. Um, so by the time you get to this, past this copse of trees, um, you can't see the project anymore on Route 66. Um, so the view of the project on Route 66 is only by the time you get down, so this is that little copse of trees I was just pointing out, you have to get past that, look over the wetland, and then be before you get to these trees here um, to be able to see that view of the project. Could you go back to the B yep. view? What, so, um, so this is a... B, that's B. No, 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 one more, there were, so that's a wall? This is, yeah, this is the back wall of the, um, the conference center here and the restaurant oh. here. So you, this right here is the roof of the okay. conference center, and this right here is the roof of the hotel. It's, it's not a separate wall. But no, 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 it's the wall of the building. Um, the, the DRB had expressed some concern about that long um, wall of the building there in this particular view, so we added some additional landscaping, which we can look at in our landscaping plan to, to, to break that up a little bit more. Can you go back to the first slide, please? I think that this, when you look at the entrance, helps to explain better the cutting of the tree and how that entrance is going to be laid out. We were talking about how the the uh, buffer came down, the wetlands buffer, and then Brian was saying how that opened it up on both sides. Yeah, yeah. It's a little better here in color to, to see it. So then there was a, a variety of viewpoints down here uh, that were taken to illustrate the, the views to, to the traveling public on I-89 or, or folks that are accessing this conserved land down here. Um, essentially because of this very tall, very dense, um, mostly uh, conifer forest here, um, which is uh, either owned by the project or part of the Route 89 right of way. Um, you can't see it from any of these perspectives, D, E, C, D, E, or F, and I can go through those pictures as well. So this is the, um, the off-ramp from the north side of Route 89, uh, looking back up at the project. Um, I would note that you can't see any of the balloons, including the 75 or 100 foot balloons from here. Uh, this is, the, here is the park and ride. So this is the stormwater pond that's on the south side of the park and ride. Again, looking back up at the project in this area, um, you can't see any of the balloons from this vantage point either. Um, this is the southbound off-ramp, and the project is up here. This is kind of the trees on the hillside behind the project, actually, um, but there's additional trees in front of the project. Uh, and again, you can't see any of those. And this is the view from the conserved land uh, to the south of the interstate. This is the, the trees uh, between the project and this, and again, you can't see any of the three balloons that were flown from, from this vantage point. So other than um, from the properties up the hill, uh, the LaFrance property and the uh, um, Gifford property, and that where the actual entrance of the hotel is, and that short section on 66 to the north, uh, you really can't see this project from anywhere else. Those are the main vantage points. Question back here. Yes. Just to let you know, I, I could see the blues on my property. I, I didn't get a G or an H in there. I'm still there. 
So you could see from your upslope from that. Yes, I could see the, the balloons. Uh, of course, I'd have to. The, uh, can I ask a question about the, where you say the balloons are? It makes it seem like there's a lot of woods there. Is that an older picture, or is that before or after you cleared? Uh, so the current the current tree line runs more like along here. Okay. Um, but this this does show the accurate location of the back. Of before the they bed cleared it, I I I wouldn't have been able to see it. Now that it's cleared and when the leaves drops, uh, I are not there. I can see the Route 66 from it, so I can see the balloons. Yes, ma'am. Can I ask a question? Um, you're doing balloons, but there's light coming. The balloons were a, a dot, but the hotel will be lit up, so there will be some visibility through the lights. And also from the Gifford property, uh, did you go to this first, the second floor or third floor to see how much could be seen at the hotel? Because I have a feeling that if it's lit up, uh, it's going to be visible. Quite well, do you want to talk about lighting now? Sure. Well, um, I have another question about. Sure. Um, so, if you go back to that last picture with the balloons, um, I, w I wondered last time why a 35 foot balloon was it? And I know that you've gotten permits to go higher than that, but just to show the difference between what was initially, you know, allowed and what what the variance went to to the higher level. But my question right now is also, further up Route 66, did you do any studies further up Route 66 to see what they could see down, um, you know, further towards Ridge Road, what they could see down there beyond? So Steve, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you drove around up there where the balloons were up, but you didn't see them from up there, so it wasn't. The correct. G was illustrated as the, you know, you can't see it from G, you can't really see it from anywhere further up. Anybody that might have a view of it uh, from Randolph Center, like these houses here, their view is blocked by the um, um, independent room facility anyway. Well, um, I was thinking even further, further. Um, up G? Uh, up, up, um, No, G. Like down G, in this area? G, take the corner, yes, yes, from that area. Yeah. So when I did the, uh, the viewing, I did go down this road okay. and up past the intersection of BTC. Um, no ability to see any of the balloons uh, or the site in there. Great. So shall we move on to lighting? Yeah, let's move on a little bit to lighting now. Uh, excuse me for one sec. I'll just have to pull that one up. Right about well, while you're yep. pulling that up, I just wanted to mention to the uh, audience in, in general, um, one of the things we do when we um, do uh, criteria eight, uh, especially as it relates to aesthetics, as we do. Um, um, the first question we ask is, does the project fit in the community, in, in, in the context with which it's being proposed? Um, so you can imagine um, a large hotel being offered to be built somewhere outside of town, out somewhere outside of ETC, sort of where you, some of your really big farms are, for instance, that you would have an issue there about context immediately. And so that's the first initial question we ask. And then um, if we decide that it, it doesn't, you know, that there might be some issues and it might have an adverse impact, then we start to ask three other questions about um, whether um, it's unreasonable, if it would, you know, the, the usual reasonable person standard, uh, does this so offend the, the um, sensibilities of a reasonable person that it shouldn't be. Um, does it fit within community standards? Um, and then finally, has there been any attempt to mitigate this through um, uh, means in, in, in such case we're about to talk about lighting, um, dark sky compliant lighting so that uh, there's no trespassing on the, on the light, for instance. So that's kind of just a shortened version of what we go through in uh, analyzing this. So it, it, it might be helpful in terms of trying to direct your comments and then you think about whether this does fit, um, you know, on the edge of a village, you know, community area like this or not, or just off an interstate. 
because um, that's going to be the kind of balancing act that you know in, in consideration we'll be doing um, when we decide about it. So uh, unfortunately, this is not a great presentation slide. <laughs> Um, but this is the photometric plan, so you can see that the majority of the site lighting is provided by uh, pole lights around the parking and um, sidewalk areas. Um, the pole lighting along the sidewalk is at a 14-foot mounting height, and the ones further out in the parking area is at a 20-foot mounting height. Um, all the fixtures are LED, LED, they're full cutoff, downcast, dark sky compliant. Um, even so far as there's a, a flagpole there that is, is the flag is going to be lit, but the light fixtures on the top of the flagpole pointing down as opposed to being on the ground pointing up at the flag like uh, many of them are. Um, average light, I'll just zoom in on this section over here. Um, fun. Um, average light level over the entire site is just over one foot candle. Um, and then if you take the parking areas in and of themselves, it's right around one and a half foot candles. Um, the one area that's generally lit up more than that is underneath the port share. It's lit up to five foot candles. Um, but that's completely uh, lit by fixtures that are up inside the canopy there. Um, so they are all only directed down right under the port share, And that's just because that really, um, the, the appearance of that area is more like the transition into the building. So it's a transition in light level between the much lower level generally on the site and the much brighter level inside the building. Um, and so if we take a look at some of the areas, so that the, the end of the calculation is where generally the end of the light is. Um, so you can see there's pretty minimal light uh, being cast outside of the area on the parking. Um, and this is illustrative too. The, the distribution of the fixtures is all cast forward into the, the parking area. So you can see here on this side of the light, we're at like two foot candles. On the back side of the light, we're at a, a half a foot candle. Um, so the lighting design has been um, done to minimize the amount of light that's cast anywhere that it's not needed, which is the, the parking area of the building. For those of us who are not familiar with candles, is there any way you can analogize that to something that we understand better? Yeah, a foot candle. Wattage or something. Wattage? Uh, no, well, wattage distance. isn't isn't really that helpful because the, so the foot candles are um, a measurement of the power of the lighting on a surface. So in this case, the surface of the ground. Um, a foot candle is roughly the amount of illumination you get from one candle on something that's a foot away, which is a funny old English unit <laughs> that involves candles, yeah. but. Um, so it's just a standardized measure of the amount of, of light that is hitting a surface. Um, so uh, a one foot candle uh, is, I'm trying to remember the analogy. Well, if we were to pull into, say, the McDonald's parking lot at night here on exit four, or the neighboring one. Um, You're going to ask me what their lighting level is. I hate to speculate um, yeah, because just, I don't have that information. But generally, one foot candle is a very low parking lot illumination. Um, the only place you're going to see parking lot illumination of this level is in a pretty um, recent development. Um, and, and so the one, the one that comes to mind is because it's a project I've worked on, it was just recently completed, is the Caledonia Spirits Distillery in Montpelier. I don't know if anyone is familiar with that at all. Um, but it's got, you know, it's got a large parking lot. Um, it's in an area of town that's not particularly well lit because it's out on the edge of town. So when you drive by that site, um, you, if you look at the ground, you can see that the ground is illuminated. But if you look at the site itself, it really, it's not like a huge source of light. Like it's, the light is going onto the ground and cars where it needs to be, but you really don't, it's, it, I was surprised, to be honest with you, um, at how little of the light is, is really visible from a roadway where you're even a little bit below and, and looking into the site. So, I mean, if you think of something like, um, a car dealership in New Jersey, where you picture in your mind what, what is light trespass, you're looking at like a 10 foot candle average. Let's get back to McDonald's for a moment there. Sure. Um, what would you just, I mean, I most of these? I, I, if I were to, to speculate, because I don't have the information no. uh, on what the foot candles are at McDonald's, I think that's lit a bit brighter than what you're going to see here. Well, two or three or? I, I am not going to give you a number. Yeah. We can go look at the We can go look at the application. Here with the light shining down. I'd be interested. You know, how, how many foot candles 
Let me let me speak to that a little bit. I, I think, and you may know the standard. Is it five? This would be like class. Yeah, I mean, a, a, at a, a typical, desktop. A typical a, desktop in an office environment could be 30, 30 foot candles at desk level. So that's, you know, uh, I don't know what we're at here. This may be 10. That and one of the one of the things that's about illumination is, and, and this has been required and, and it's evolved, you know, as the technology's evolved, we used to be sodium vapor was all we wanted for Act 250. Then the idea of cutoff fixtures, the standard is that you don't see the source of illumination from uh, a travel way, right? So you're not looking up and under, so you're cutting that off. It doesn't do any good to um, spend the money on a fixture that's lighting up the neighbors, for instance. So when you look at a parking area like this, which could be like a, a supermarket parking area, the design is to ensure safety. It is to be seen. You can't read a newspaper. That's not the, the standard. Uh, but rather, from a security standpoint, a safety standpoint, are you able to be seen? When you walk out to your car, do you have the sense of security and confidence that you're not walking into a black hole? And you could do that with one foot candle. I mean, it, it doesn't sound like a lot, but you are seen and it's not scary type thing. The other thing that we did on this, and, and I'm sure Steve can add more to it, is we're not doing any building flooding, I mean, uplight. We're not showcasing the building, lighting it up. There are no lights up in the eaves to come down or anything. That's not the point. Uh, I mean, when you think about it, this is hotel that's hidden, unlike most interstate hotels. There is no expectation of this being a place that somebody pulls off because they see it now that we're ready to stop for the evening. Most people go online to book their hotels so you can hide them. And the same goes for the illumination on the building. It doesn't have to be showcased, so we're trying to minimize that. Um, is there um, any timers on any of this at all, do you know? Or so uh, it's likely that the area that around the hotel itself uh, won't be able to be shut off on a timer. Um, I think the outer areas of illumination, um, certainly we could consider something like a 50% illumination, but um, you know, one of the things we're working with on this project is that there, there are certain standards that the, the national um, hotel chain requires, and some of the things are around safety. So. Um, you know, I'm not sure if they would be uh, able to construct this project and then really not have lighting, especially in the right around the hotel area. Well, let me ask you a different question. Um, as I recall from reading your application, when it comes to choosing the amount of parking, you're trying to put together the rooms and the, correct me if I'm wrong, the conference center and the restaurant and kind of utilize, not add each one up, but try to have that's right. If you want to explain that a little further. Sure. So uh, the, the, the amount of parking is selected based on a shared use parking analysis. And typically the way that works is you look at the um, typical um, generation of parking for each use, but then you, um, re you apply a time-based factor um, to see if there's overlap in the, the peak time that the things are under use. So the way we came up with the number was we, we said, you know, here's the parking generation for the hotel and the hotel employees. Here's the restaurant. Here's the conference center. Um, you know, and at certain times of day, the hotel is likely to be using 30% of its parking, but the conference center is using 90% of its parking. Um, so, con comparing various scenarios and different times of day, weekdays and weekends, um, we looked at where was the peak parking demand um, among the uses, considering the variation in parking demand over time, um, which is typically how a shared use parking analysis is done. So. Um, we certainly, and this was one of the things we requested of the town, um, this is uh, t about a 20% reduction, what we're showing for parking, uh, relative to what would be required under the Randolph zoning regulations if we just took each use and, and calculated its parking demand. Um, so it's 236, I think is the number of parking spaces. Um, and under the Randolph zoning regulations, if you just took them at face value, you'd be looking at something closer to 290. Uh, parking spaces. Now, we want you to be successful if we approve this, um, and so you're hoping to keep it 
filled, I would assume. But it would be kind of interesting to see if, you know, there are going to be some quiet periods. Um, that's just kind of inevitable, I think. And if the outer parts of some of those lights could be quieted down and reduced when it was, I mean, if, you could, if there was some sensitivity that was possible with that, and if the national um, Hampton Inn would be agreeable to that kind of thing, I mean, um, I, I think, you know, what I think the concern from the neighbors tends to be that they're up above this mostly. And um, um, like when I come out of my farmhouse and look to the south, I'm always trying to figure out what the glow I do see is. And what, and I never can quite figure it out to be honest, because there's just Baker's store in Post Mills. <laughs> and that's about it. Yeah, so this project really shouldn't contribute to any sky glow because it's all, you know, that those, those kind of things are from light leakage up into the air, right? And all of these fixtures are downcast and cut off and specifically designed to minimize light leakage. So, um, you know, like I said with that, that cow and spirits development, like, even though you're looking at it from down below, you don't perceive that, like, light is up high. You can perceive that the things on the ground are lit. So if you can see the ground of this development at night, you will see that it's lit, but it's not going to be, like, blowing up into the sky, none of the elements above the, the 20 feet uh, mounting height of those uh, fixtures will be illuminated, other than light that comes out of the windows from inside the building or something like that. So um, it's, not, it's not going to be, like I said, like a car dealership where you see this bubble of glow from far away. It's, it really, it's, it's really quite impressive what, what modern lighting fixtures can do so, in terms so of I, limiting where that light trespass goes. I saw, goes. Right. I saw the neighbors light up. <laughs> so to speak. Literally, yeah. When you mentioned the the wind, the uh, exactly. the the resident, uh, the uh, guests at, at the inn. Um, do you want to show us again what, how much is exposed to that direction, um, uphill or whatever? Take a peek at that if we can. Some of your. Uh, I seem to have lost it here. Give me one second. That would be this. Into the window there space it is. 66. So. Um, the hotel, the windows are all on the north side and the south side here. Um, so from up the hill, and then the windows, there's the windows on the conference center are all, you know, these three faces of the project. So there are very few windows uh, that face this direction at all from the project. So you can kind of see, um, here's the front of the hotel where all the windows are, and there's the side of the hotel where there are either no windows or only the stairwell. I'm not sure. Do you uh, know, Steve? There's a just this corridor. The corridor has a window on each floor. Yeah. So, so one, one window, window on each floor, floor at the end of the hotel. Yeah. And, and, and I, I, um, the loading dock that's on the back of the building that faces this. What, what will that have for lighting? Uh, there's no formal loading dock on any of these buildings. So um, any of the deliveries, there's just there's an area for trucks to park, but the deliveries will then be unloaded off the truck and walked into one of the doors of the building. So there's nothing that you would look at and say that's a loading dock. There's a little bit of area of pavement for a truck to park, um, but the deliveries won't be happening um, late into the evening. But the, the, I'm assuming there's still lighting on the where the deliveries on that side of the building. Only the parking lot lighting. There's no additional lighting for the delivery area. Right. And again, it, I mean, if you if you think about this perspective, um, you know the what's what's the roof? What's the eave height here, Steve? Uh, Do you know? Sixteen feet. Around 16. Yeah. So I mean, this is this is roughly the height of the um, lighting fixtures in the parking lot. Um, so certainly from up here, you're looking down at the top of the of the lighting fixtures. Um, and as you can see, the majority of the parking field isn't very visible from this direction anyway because it's blocked by the building, which is taller than all of those lighting uh, lights. So, um, you know, if you're up a little higher, if you're on the second or third floor of this building and you can see the actual parking lot, um, you might see it and you might see the lights. But from this particular vantage point at night, um, you would see little, if any, of, of the lighting uh, 
on this project. So again, because of the setting of the project and because of the, you know, the, the parking being focused on the side where it's towards the road and there's the majority of those very tall trees, you know, we're trying to be sensitive to the people who can see um, the lit up portions of the site at night. Any further questions about the lighting at this point? Oh, I, just one more thing I wanted to mention. There, there was a comment about the height of the building being re related to where you can see light from. Um, none of the exterior lighting is anywhere near as tall as the building. Um, and so, um, you know, again, other than the windows, which I don't know are, you know, there, there's not really anything we can do about that. And, and you know, the people that are in those rooms aren't going to have their lights on all night either. Um, you know, there's there's really nothing up at the height of the building that's going to be externally illuminated on this project. Nothing higher than 20 feet, which is the mountain height of the park. I, I would lines. think you're going to probably be the almost the most affected. Well, sir, I can see uh, if you go back to that ABC one you got uh, the last picture, where my house is behind it there, mm -hmm. up above there, and you can look over to the parking lot. Uh, I believe that's to the barn and McDonald's there. Uh, at night, I see the evening glow on that, but from what I'm understanding, it's going to be a totally different type, I guess. But you'll probably be looking into their windows. Yeah, the that's, yeah. it'll be <laughs> fairly close. That, that'll be blocking my view now that I get to look at 66 since they're clearing. They cleared that field. I can see them in 66. I would mention that the, the Shabbat residence uh, is really oriented uh, Mid yeah, uh, my views are, are orientated west, so I've got my my property views yeah, of west. my property around there. They're yeah, the right. Of the I have a front porch there that faces. That right, direction. so they're, the front porch of their house is here, and it's, it's oriented to taking the long views down yeah. this way over here. That's yeah. the back porch. So you look at two decks. You see Pico uh, and Killington from your house, or no? I got some uh, uh, ever. Uh, Pines and stuff that are kind of in the way. Uh -huh. uh, I can't I can see. see. Everything you can see from so exit that's four, that's, that's yeah. what I've got to view. That's what I originally designed the house for. Sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. Also, the uh, you, you bring up um, McDonald's again. I think we'd find that I'm not an engineer, so I can speak like I don't have to. But because of the closeness of, say, the gas pumps, to the barn and uh, McDonald's being so close that those that lighting is more similar to what we're designing here for right up next to the building at the entry. As you go out farther, you don't have that situation at the other side of the development, so you don't have the low candle power. Virtually all of those prop all of those <coughs> uses have the high higher candle power because you need it for pumping gas and you know, so forth. So well, that's, that's why I was trying to get him to get you to speculate a little bit on that. No, I so that you, need to, yeah. you need to be able to read your credit card. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah it's, 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 it's a lot brighter. BTC is pretty bright up on top of the hill. Mm -hmm. um, I've grown up here my whole life, and BTC has always had a glow. So the 28 spaces behind the restaurant, the conference center there. Um, those would tend to be empty at night, right? Yeah, those are in intended for employee use. You're talking about this parking area right here. Yeah, right there. Yep. And any overflow, although you'll have some pretty upset guests if they have to park way over there. Yeah, the, so. intention, the intention is we've provided enough parking in these three parking areas around the hotel for hotel guests. So this is where, I mean, I think reasonably, everyone from the hotel is going to park here. Um, this is intended to be employee parking, and then this is the general, you know, parking for people who are accessing the restaurant and the conference center. Um, you know, and certainly if, when there are larger events, there's going to be staff on site, you know, managing where people park and stuff. Mm -hmm. Not all the time, but when needed. Okay.
what's everyone's feeling about this? We've got we've got three to do. We're still going to have nine to talk about. We can go a little while longer. We got traffic to talk about. I don't think. I don't know about you all, but I found myself if I'm going too long when I start to. Do you all want to try to plow through, or? Yeah. I got a little work. Okay. All right, we'll keep going then. We need a one little five break here somewhere. No, I didn't bring food this time. Okay. Um, so we've done lighting a bit. We can always get back to them if you have other thoughts later. Let's talk about the the tent and the noise and the number of events here. Proposing that kind of thing. Okay, the, uh, from a growth standpoint, and, and uh, Paul can help us with this because he has experience with it, we tried to, or we did locate it um, the, the best we could uh, from a visual impact and so forth. I pointed out on the site, and uh, to repeat, when we stood out at the, uh, the site, the event area, uh, we, uh, Brian indicated that we we're going to be dropping that about 10 feet. And what we're planning on is that that then becomes somewhat tucked into, you know, the hillside to the, to the south and to the southwest. So, uh, talking first about sound. Um, the sound will, uh, the, the, the closest neighbor, the closest building right now is Mr. Chabot, and that's around 600 feet away. Uh, hmm? Pardon me? 605? 600 from the 10 area, it's 355 from the closest parking area. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm just talking about the 10. Oh, the 10. Okay. 600, yeah. All right. And through, through the woods, uh, and then uh, again, the, the, the 10 area is sunk. So, from a, a sensitivity of design and trying to mitigate impact, uh, we felt that that was the place best best to put it. Um, the uh, you know with the the time and the operation of it being typically in the temperate months, uh, the trees are leaved out. There's more acoustic benefit. Uh, as it's going up to the closest. In fact, we were talking this morning about his ability to hear the difference from the highway noise, from the interstate noise, whether the leaves are on the trees or not. So uh, that's uh, that's hopefully helping to, to mitigate things as well, because most of the operation of that will be uh, when there are leaves on the trees. So uh, beyond that, the Thinking for the use is, is the obvious uh, weekend use, but there may also be during the temperate months uh, uses combined with the conference center. So you could imagine that there may be an activity in the conference center where they choose to break for lunch out into to a tent area or open space, whether there's a tent there or not. So that's. Um, you know, we see it as, as those warmer months and that the current operation that, uh, uh, the, that is imagined is that it, all activities would cease at 10 o'clock on any weekend night. And you can have, you've got more experience on it. Yeah, so I was a prior owner of Eagle Mountain Campground and we come in front of the district um, and added 30 lots. And we had bands every Saturday night and we were done by 10 o'clock. Um, that's, that was the rules. We manage it. There's no, you know, might give the band one more song, but that's it. Um, Where are we? Uh, Abel Mount Campground in Bright Tree. I was in front of you folks to add 30 yeah. lots there. Um, I brought in 500 to 600 people every weekend. Then we had bands on Saturday night. And I think you'll show, you'll see that I had the track history of managing the people and not disrupting. We were right next to a mobile home park over acres, and that's my job is to manage it, not let it go beyond. And I have a proven history of doing that. So we're t so you're talking about um, how about amplified music? Uh, so you're talking about at these 
Yeah, I had bands and stuff. They would be done by. No, 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 but how about what are you proposing here? I mean, we need more detail on what you're actually. Proposing well, is there a state here? standard of 65 decibels that you're not? 56 dBA at the doorstep. At the doorstep. I mean, we're going to work within the state parameters of what decibels are. We'll, we'll probably condition it with that, but I mean, we're trying to get a little better understanding. I mean, you know. <laughs> I, I, I also want to add another thing. We're in the business of a hotel where people are staying, and we want to accommodate our customers. People are not going to come to our hotel if it's a party and there's loud music all the time. You know, we are accommodating the traveling that, public. Um, this is oh. why. This is why. You know, when I first looked at this proposal, mm -hmm. the hotel has its own set of issues. As soon as you start to put a tent up outdoors, you open up a whole other set of issues, um, and despite your experience, and I understand that, um, when it comes to trying to understand this, if your proposal is to have this during the, as you say, temperate every single weekend, if you can, uh, and then in the middle of the week, we need to understand and know that, that that's what you're in fact asking for. That is what we're asking um, it's, for. It's, you want to go to 10 o'clock at night, that you want amplified music, um, uh, you know, all that kind of thing, and then what you're going to try to do to mitigate it. I mean, do you want to have fireworks? Um, Riverside wanted to do that. Um, we would have to come back in front of you if we were to. Well, you know, no, we don't have to be plans. asking for that right now. It's probably not. You know, no, we. So we need to. I think we need to have a little better understanding of what it is you're actually asking for. On it. Uh, I mean, it, or is it essentially carte blanche, whatever you want to do? The one of the difficulties that we're having after we got after the submission, and Linda asked me to try to better define it. One of the problems is that it's it's not a um, a single, say, a band or a single disc jockey. There could be several or different different ones. So it's hard to come up with saying, well, this is going to be the wattage or this is going to be the volume and so forth. So going back to reasonable, you know, expectation, I honestly don't know. And having done a few of these, how we do anything other than a standard um, of, of, of sound, of the, of the sound volume. Well, I mean, my suggestion would be if you draw, withdraw that part of the application at this point until you get your hotel up and you get your venues going, and then you come back and ask for that at a later date when you understand better what it is you want to do. Or, um, you know, you narrow yourself down a little bit more. Um, uh, we have to have evidence to make positive findings. Criteria 8, yes, the burden falls on those opposing it, but on the other hand, we need to have something in front of us that we can make positive findings based on. And simply saying that you're going to have a tent there and want to amplify music and want to do it whenever you want to do it and just cut off at 10 o'clock at night isn't typically the, the kind of thing that in my eight-year experience doing this that we've, you know, just, you know, given approval to towards um, without some sort of other mitigation and understanding of it. I mean, just to simply say, well, you're going to keep it within 56 dBA, or you're going to be up at the neighbor's property with the, you know, with your sound monitor, you know, doing that kind of thing, and you're going to require him to have the sound monitor up there. I mean, you don't offer any sound evidence here. You haven't done a sound study or whatever. Um, you don't even really understand fully. You would need some modeling to understand that you're, you're dropping that down you know, 10 feet, what that really means for you. Um, hillsides tend to bounce sound all across the, the way and whatnot. I do understand what you're saying about about having, um, being a hotel and having those who stay there not want to have to listen to that. But on the other hand, that could well be who's staying at the hotel, um, those attending a, a, a reasonably large wedding and that kind of thing. So. I just, I'm not sure right now what I'm hearing from you is, you know, very well thought out yet as compared to the rest of your project. Uh, On the same token, though, in real life, like at the campground, I knew when the band was too loud and I had to ask him to turn it down. I, I think of myself as a neighbor and what the repercussions, I mean, we're going to be there on site I and mean, it's going to be managed. We're not running a party. Yeah. It, it's. I understand. It's part of the wedding business. You know, we're trying to create a wedding venue. As, as far as the modeling. So you are trying to create a wedding venue. Well, there's someone, yeah, someone can rent a tent. They can come. The, um, 
There's the, nothing like that. The experience, uh, in my experience, both interior and exterior, and I talked to uh, an acoustician, and the problem is that you know they can look at it and they can do some modeling, but there are never any guarantees. You know, and then you get into what irritates a neighbor, the difference between sound and noise. I mean, we've had that argument before too, where you know something is like a, a quarry. You know, it may not be as loud, but it's an irritating noise. Well, so, I'll tell you one thing, not having any idea what the sound is going to be like and what they will be exposed to is, is going to give them a lot more apprehension than having come to a hearing and having at least RSG or some expert try to assuage them to some degree yeah. of what, I mean, we have no idea right now what it's going to be like, either from any of the neighborhoods, other than your assurance that, you know, you're going to know when it's too loud and that kind of thing. I don't know, maybe the rest of the commissioner can feel be better about that than I do at the moment. Yeah. And I just feel bad to think that your whole permit is hanging in the wind over this tent, for instance. It's an amenity. The, your tent event mm -hmm. or the, or the um, convention. We're trying to accommodate our customers and what their needs are. I mean, that's what we're in business for. I mean, that's how we're going to be successful. I know, but, okay. You've done a what I would call a very excellent job of citing it mm -hmm. relative, except for one neighbor perhaps in this situation, unfortunately. Um, you've shown us how it's really not visible from the road, with, from the interstate, from all these other spots, mm -hmm. which, you know, that wouldn't necessarily mean it couldn't be approved. <laughs> uh, it, it's kind of a bonus from that point of view. You've showed us how architecturally you've tried to diminish the height and, and the, the, the mass of it through the architectural design. Um, you've showed us, you know, with the lighting, how you've got it all downward lit. I mean, it, to me, it's quite well thought, thought out from what you've presented so far. Um, and then you plop this tent down there, and there's just nothing else coming with that. Um, it's going to be done by 10 o'clock. Well, that's about all we know. And in the summertime, I mean, yeah. that it gets dark at 9, 9.30. I mean, well, I'll give you a different relative. example of one. And we have customers that we're trying to accommodate. No, I, I understand that, that the, the customers are not standard. my concern here. My concern are the 10 But it's my, it's my concern. Well, it's your economic issue, yes, but that's not our concern here. Our concern is what it, under aesthetics, what is the impact of the noise in the area? Mm -hmm. And yes, there's a lot of traffic noise on, on the interstate. I, I, can witness that from having sat there and listened to it, but this is a whole nother, whole nother can of worms, if you will, um, that we have to, you know. I don't want people in a room hearing all the music from the tent. Let me let me ask if um, if we can take a minute to to discuss it. You mentioned taking a break anyway. Yeah. Um, I mean, you don't have to do that now. I'm just saying that. Um, and we can ask for more, we might require you to go do a sound study. And we're, we're, I'm just not sure how sensitive, how quickly you want to get necessarily. I mean, I'm not trying to hang anything over your heads with this. I'm just trying to present this as kind of, you know, uh, the I, way I personally see the, you know, this at the moment. Um, neighbors have other concerns and whatnot, for sure. I think um, <clears throat> if you, we can, we can uh, contact RSG. We could probably get a turnaround from, uh, you know, some modeling. Um, this just just doesn't fit the level of, 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 of um, well, you know, how well thought out your project is to me. The rest of it, I think I've tried to outline that too. Right. So one of the owners is Perry Armstrong, who owns Rain or Shine Tent Company. And he does do wedding venues around the state, you know, as far as Woodstock, Stowe, and stuff like well, that. And you have the conference center. And we have and the you said it holds 400 people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the tent would be just a very occasional thing. I think that's what, that's what. Uh, well, well we, we're not being told that, though. We're, no. You know, right now they're not, they're just basically asking us to approve it without any stipulations at all. They haven't come and said, well, we'll only have five events here. We'll have one a month. We'll have. If if getting if getting modeling gets us over that hump, because in uh, I won't say it, it doesn't make any difference, but on on frequency, but if if the modeling showed um, 
and maybe stemming from the modeling further mitigation, then maybe that's the way to go. Well, another example would be we're not going to have any amplification outside of that tent. Um, uh, we're going to, you know, when we have weddings, it's going to all have to be, you know, uh, just you know, live band. You know, live, you know, without amplification, just we're, we're envisioning a, a kind of wedding that the cello is playing or, you know, something like that. that you know, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about, where it sounds like you're, and I'm not saying you can't have amplification. I'm just saying I can't understand what the impact of the noise on the neighbors is going to be. Right. But on the same token, if we're under the tent, we have people, and this, let's say the state sin standard is 65 decibels, why can't we have that and say, no, you got to turn the band down, you're above our threshold? Well, it's 56 dBA at the rest. If that's what it is, if that's oh, what it is, why can't we do form. that? With the band that's you there, you could ask us to impose that standard with. I don't have else a problem with doing that because uh, I have that much. But then, you know, we need to. We're thinking not. We're also thinking about the neighbors when we think about this and and what potential burden that places on them to try to figure out if that is in fact how loud it is and whatnot. So, anyhow, I've said what I've said, and you all can think about it. I think maybe we will take a little lunch break here. Um, I'm going to, you know, recess for half an hour. I don't think we need to go into town particularly or whatever. I just take a little break to think about things. Well, well, let's start it. Let's call it 45 minutes. We'll start back up at 1 o'clock. Mr. Chair, I assume we're addressing the 39B everyone. We absolutely are. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you farmers didn't have to work. So we're in recess till 1 o'clock. 1 o'clock. The other one we needed more for the contrast than we do this. Okay. You all want to if take we off need it again, again. I, I know where the switch is. <laughs> Good. Uh, okay, ready to go? Yeah. Okay, we're going to start to talk about uh, 9B, prime agricultural soils and mitigation, on site and off site. Yep. The um, uh, Ari and I have been working since last spring uh, on this and we identified the two um, areas of protected soils that we would be disturbing. So what is shown up there in what colors? Uh, the disturbed? Green yeah. and red. Green and red. Green is the light one? Yes, on the outside. So that is, those are the two areas of, um, <coughs> or those are the two, that is the area of the two disturbed soils. We, um, uh, did the measurements in trying to find qualifying soils for on-site mitigation, and we show that in the uh, light blue, light blue down in the bottom. We were there are certainly other soils, but it's uh, uh, we're not able to because of the either the configuration or or they're wooded. Uh, the type B, I think it was B that's allowed to be wooded. All right, and so we have for the on-site mitigation. So we are into the woods in here, but the soil types, uh, this, first of all, this, we own all this, but it's not, um, you know, access, well, it's not, the confirmation is not, doesn't meet the standard. And where some of these soils, we could also use but they're wooded, and the, and the sea soils are not allowed to be wooded on site mitigation. So we came up with uh, that area in blue that could be used for on site mitigation, which left us, I want to say, 10.89 acres that were requesting off site mitigation. That's fine with us. I mean, we did, we crammed in what we could. And um, Linda and I talked about some of the other in the offsite. I mean, it's uh, the multipliers. I mean, this is, you know, the backs. Um, and it's a 
recent years, the per acre cost has really gone up. But it's, um, it's unfortunate, but we did the best we could to try to shape things the way they are. And the, the, the parcel over on the left side, Ari, wasn't, you couldn't use that because of uh, slopes? My understanding is that that was not proposed on site mitigation. Uh, Tom, can you remind me what the soils were on that, on that side? That of the was the, uh, the type that you couldn't have as wooded. Oh, right. It's oh, yeah, yeah. So it's it's statewide so statewide yeah. B, that's what it was. So it was a statewide soil, uh, but with a B footnote, which means a potential wetness limitation. Mm -hmm. And the NRCS, which uh, rates the soils, um, uh, the agency's practice sort of pursuant to their classifications that statewide B soils, if they're forested, do not meet the definition of primary ag soils because they already have a wetness limitation and on top of that they're forested. Usually, uh, whether or not the soils are forested would not change their status as being primary ag except for these soils with a wetness limitation. So those had a wetness limitation so wouldn't have been suitable for on-site mitigation. That was the, the reason. The the Otherwise, we'd have come close for everything on-site. And similarly, with this, this area down here is the same soil type, so that's why this sort of ends here at you know sort of a reasonable point where the, the, the forests, forested soil with wetness limitation sort of takes over in this area, so that wasn't available for mitigation either, even though it's a it's a reasonable term for the site. So, well, yeah, I'm just curious, this is more academic. Um, sure. So you say it's a B, I mean, that's the slope. Uh, statewide, sorry, not, not a B no. slope, different, different no, use of the term B. Uh, statewide, in parentheses, B soil, meaning uh, it's an NRCS classification, meaning statewide importance. However, it has a wetness limitation. Okay. Right. Um, so unless that limitation is easily overcome, it wouldn't be a primary ag soil. So when it's forested as well, yeah. I could just, you know, Tom did a good job, but if I could just say sort of one more time that the key uh, recommendations the agency had that are also in its uh, review letter, it was that the project would impact 7.24 acres of primary agricultural soils for which with the multiplier, some of them were prime soils, the Buckman loam of a multiplier, a higher multiplier. So with the multipliers, 16.76 acres of mitigation were warranted. And uh, as Tom stated, 5.87 proposed on site. And the agency accepted those 5.87 acres as being sufficient, uh, provided there was no concerns about wetlands, which it sounds like there's, there's not in that area, um, but there's sort of a standard contingency about subject to confirmation from the wetlands program. Uh, and then 10.89 acres for the remainder that were proposed offsite, subject to the appropriate circumstances analysis of, of this commission. Um, and, and, and what's the fee they're paying again for the offsite? Let me get you the exact number. Excuse me? A little over 5,000. Yeah, I'll get you the, just give me one sec. Per acre. Per acre. Per acre. Yeah. Per acre. Yeah. No, no, no. So I think it's almost 56,000, <laughs> right? I just yeah. thought everyone in the day, you know, folks might be interested in knowing that. Right, so, so yeah, it's so like 56, the exact number. It's, uh, it is 5,138. You had it. Good, good memory, Linda. Uh, uh, 5,138 per acre. Um, and again, 10.89 acres are proposed off site, so you can do the multiplication. And yes, that for, the, for those in the room who don't know, that money uh, goes to the provided the commission finds appropriate circumstances and issues a permit condition consistent with that. Those funds, in a general sense, go to the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. They're used for the uh, conservation of farmland in the region uh, with an emphasis on conserving prime soils through permanent conservation easements. So, so that's, that's where those, primarily where those funds go. back to anything with noise or do we feel like we covered that? Do the neighbors feel like they got to say what they wanted about noise? We no. Um, I think we <laughs> right. I think we stopped with just um, you know not knowing what kind of events are going to be happening there. I know um, uh, my daughter got married a few years ago. She didn't you know, it's not popular to find places that stop at 10 o'clock at night for if you have a wedding and a bunch of out-of-town guests. They want to keep going until midnight. And if that's going to be both Friday night and Saturday night all summer long, um, you know, so two, 
to the point of asking what kind of events, how often, um, you know, as a wedding venue, stopping at 10 o'clock, it might be, might not be the best. Would 10 o'clock be acceptable to you? Um, you know, if it were a neighbor putting a tent up in a backyard for their daughter's wedding and it's one weekend in the summer, you know, have at it. You know, I'd be happy about that. If it's Friday night and Saturday night from, you know, May till October, uh, no, no. That's that's a big intrusion on, on um, the peace and quiet that is normally Randolph Center. Let me just ask you one question about your, your situation up there because we didn't yeah. go up there. So you're thinking of building out in that field. That's what you testified to. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've owned the property for 35 years, paid taxes on it, hoping to come back to Vermont. But there's no house on it now? There's not a house on it now. Okay, so it's a we, we, as a family, go up there and picnic. We, uh -huh. you know, in, And you yourself, if I saw the address correctly, you're from outside Rochester? Yes. Her family used to own this piece of land? Yes. Oh, okay. yeah, I, grew up I, I, I was a buyer's agent for somebody who bought it 13 years ago. Oh, okay. So, and they kept that piece in the middle there, that five acres. I was my understanding so, for protection. So if you go back to the, um, I actually own two pieces of mm -hmm. land yeah. there. Yeah. One yeah. I've owned for a very long time that I would plan on building the house on. You can see so there, right there, that one. Right, those two parcels, right. those two parcels are both mine. They're both listed as separate parcels. Mm -hmm. And the second one that's a little more downhill that really is what abuts um, more closely to the hotel property. It was just to give me a, whatever I want to do with it. You know, if I want to throw cannabis on it or goats on it or whatever, you know, I don't know what the state allows. But originally, this piece was part of this piece of the yeah. little frame fits, and they kept this piece to go with you, right? Yes. Yeah, and it was for protection of anything that might happen. Right. So it's right, but yeah. it's treated as two separate, two separate tax bills, two mm -hmm. separate pieces of property. But yes, it was her family. It was her family that sold it's been it. Been in the family. Right? Gupta, and that's who we bought it from. Mm -hmm. And I had represented him as a buyer's agent. I've been selling property for 22 years here in Randolph. Mm -hmm. So, quite obviously, you have a direct, potential direct line. You can, now, is there any spot up on that upper piece that you could build that you would still have a view and, and not really see them? Um, mm, pretty much no. I mean, the view, the... Um, does it flatten it, out up there? It, it does flatten out a little bit up near the top, um, but there's a tree line, a, a hedge line of... Oh, Can yeah, I see that. go to the map and just? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. It's just easier than pointing <laughs> back there. So it does flatten out a little bit right in here, mm -hmm. but there's a um, there's trees here, yeah. upper trees. So the best spot for building a home again, no permits at, at this point, but there has been a there was a house on the property a bunch of years ago. Um, it's, it's right there, and it has, like like um, Morgan, Morgan Orchards, it has a nice view that goes out through, um, through there, but it, it does go right over the top of the property. What do you see, um, I mean, you have the whole village behind you, so are you downslope from right. them so you don't? So one of the pictures showed there's a, a tree line here, um, so I don't, I don't see too much. Um, and the trees have grown up in here a little bit, so I don't, there are places in there where a lot of the trees to grow up, so I don't see too much of, of Route 66, Morgan Orchards, or, um, or over in this direction. So most of my entire view is out there to the mountains beyond. Um, and this does, this slopes down um, a bit, doesn't have quite the views. Like when you stand down here, you don't, you don't get um, but it is, yeah, it is what it is. Thank you. All right. You got a question? Yeah. So we're talking about eight now. Uh, yes. Right here, yeah, eight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not sure what the uh, details. I know it has the noise, yeah. which 
when you all were clearing the field or people that walk in that field and they have a regular conversation, I can hear them. Mm -hmm. So I, I know I'm going to be hearing car dares, slam and everything, and it's going to be underneath the decibels. I know that's, that's part of that. Uh, as far as the, the party going till 10 o'clock or whatever, I, I don't have too much concerns on that, as long as it's 80s music. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, and I it's guess not 80s, music. Free access. Yeah. It's not 80s music. Yeah, yeah. Free access, well, it's all that 70, stuff. 60s. Cool. Oh, wow. yeah. Uh, okay, we'll go with the But uh, I still have concerns about the noises. I, I, I understand about the noises. Uh, uh, lighting, uh, you know, Maybe I used to want What's that? Sir? Maybe 80s country. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> wrong. Uh, some country in the truck. <laughs> um, the other concern is, I don't know that falls into it. I, I, I retired from the Marine Corps in 1999. I bought this property to build on as a retirement or an investment property. Mm. Okay. Well, that's going to make my decision. They put a hotel on there. It's not my retirement property. It, it, I'm going to be selling it. So then I'm looking at my property value. With a hotel and everything uh, going right beside it, I don't see, I don't have facts and I've done research, but I'm worried about my property value right. dropping thirty, forty thousand dollars initially, and then after four or five years, it will go back up or something like that. So now I'm in a a problem because I'm retiring next summer. So I'm going to try to sell my house in the middle of this being built and stuff. So yeah. this is what I didn't know where to put that. Yeah, there is no place to put it for us. You're, you're absolutely right not knowing where it is because we don't consider economic impacts on neighbors and that kind of thing. Okay. It's not part of the criteria. Yeah. Um, and it might well have that. I, I have no idea. Well, I, I, yeah. It's very, yeah. It very, part of the reason I think they don't do it is it's extremely speculative, but I mean, it's pretty much what come, would come out of every neighbor's mouth. Yeah, and that's why I couldn't find. I you know, you need to frame it more in terms of the aesthetics, and you know, if you're yeah, yeah, really trying to have something not happen, then you have to follow the criteria. So the noise would be, a, you know, noise is, you know. is definitely a problem. My views is like they stated to the west. But I also have the views that you know, I have a small set of woods. If I'm getting lighting and noise and everything from there, it's just taken away from me tucking my place. The other thing too is there's a burden of um, proof kind of basically here being, uh, being our judicial, quasi-judicial thing and different criteria have different burdens of proof mm -hmm. and the criteria eight is actually on those opposing the project. So mm -hmm. it really becomes incumbent upon if they can produce enough evidence for us to make positive findings, which I was questioning a little bit with what they're asking for <coughs> in the noise, and I think I made that clear to them this morning, um, that I was skeptical at this point anyway, then it really falls on your shoulders opposing the project, if you truly are opposing it, to, so, to present us that the noise is going to be above and beyond the 56 dBA, you bring in a noise expert, and on and on and on it goes. You should see yeah, how yeah. expensive all that can get. Yes. You, you'll lose that thirty to $40,000 oh, yes, in a heartbeat. I've already been Unfortunately, yes. um, so there's no clean solution to a lot of that. Okay. Yeah. Besides bringing you up on my property and having somebody talk in the field. And well, no, no, we appreciate that. Face. I mean, no, we, um, we we don't have to necessarily go there to believe you. That's yeah, I understand. You know. But yeah, I I, I yeah. totally understand. Yeah, that's it. Thanks. You know, we also can be aware of the fact that we could, you know, the interstate is pretty loud too, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. so it's all those things that go when you try to It depends to on the out. days, it depends on it, whether the leaves are down or not. Mm -hmm. My concern was all, once the leaves are down and I can see the hotel, and I can see, you know, people and stuff, that the No, no, I, I, I think there's no doubt that we would probably all agree that you're going to be impacted, and you're certainly going to be impacted with thinking about mm -hmm. your, your home you might go, there's no doubt about that. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Um, 
while we're on the subject of noise, yeah. um, <clears throat> during the recess we were discussing the uh, comments you had made regarding the, uh, looking for more information around the operation of the uh, town event area. Um, and uh, we'd like to propose um, that we uh, prepare and present uh, a noise monitoring and management plan to you. Um, so that'll include the, um, some details about the operation of the Ten Event Center, but um, you know we really feel like trying to tell you what's going to happen there now is is too uh, difficult at this point because it's going to depend a little bit on the market, and, and we could tell you something, but we could very well have something completely different to happen in ten years. Um, so after discussing it, we feel that having a plan to manage the impacts is a better strategy for minimizing impacts on the neighboring properties rather than trying to say what is exactly going to happen there. Um, so what we would propose is um, the sound management plan that includes um, monitoring program for sound. Um, so for instance, when there's an outdoor event, um, there'll um, be some, and we'll put this in the plan, we don't have all the details yet, but we'll put it in the plan, some um, facility that the owners have committed to to monitoring the sound levels at the property line and um, you know comparing them to the <clears throat> the typical Act 250 sound thresholds. Um, at, you know, we can identify some relevant points and everyone can look and, and to see if they feel comfortable with those locations. Um, and then to go along with the monitoring, there'd be record keeping um, so that we could go back and say, here is this date, here's our monitoring, here's the results of the monitoring, this is what the sound levels were. Um, so that if there's questions about that, then we can, we can have a record that people can go back and rely on. Um, <clears throat> so beyond the monitoring and record keeping, the other portions that we would propose to put in the sound management plan um, would be some standards for communications with people who are actually running the events. <clears throat> so um, everyone who comes in from the outside to do an event who's not part of the hotel staff, there's going to be a contract, um, you know, so we can propose um, some contract provisions and some like uh, example communication that we could give to them, where we would say, you know, for example, like. You have to do a sound check where we can see what your proposed levels are and make sure that they're adequate. You know, it's limited to this, the hours are limited to that, those kinds of things. Uh, for communication with the event people to make sure that's clear and that we have a way of uh, monitoring and, and, and controlling what's happening with any events there. Um, and then also having a section for a protocol with communication with the neighbors. Um, so that there's a clear line of communication between the neighbors and the ownership um, that would allow for you know, if something's happening, it gives them a way to get in touch with somebody and say, hey, we think this is too loud, and initiate the discussion, of, okay, here's what our monitoring is looking like, here's what's happening, we'll go talk to them, that kind of stuff, so that it doesn't, you know, get escalated straight to the state police or something like that, certainly the ownership would prefer to be able to communicate directly with the neighbors and, and make a neighborly effort to, you know, um, address any concerns that they may have in a lot of times it's happening. Um, obviously, we don't have this put together today, but you know, we, we might request that you, um, you know, when you recess the hearing, issue a hearing recess memo asking us to give you the management plan, and then the commission can have a chance to review it. It can be posted publicly so the neighbors have a chance to review it before everything is finalized. That sounds like a good idea. Um, we might, in that recess memo, have some suggestions for it too. Um, you know, a very simple thing is <coughs> you actually have that tent with all the sides up or do you keep the sides of the tent down on, on the back side, on the lady side, on the, the neighbor side over here, that kind of thing. Yeah, certainly. That's, that's protocol. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's, what, that's, a, that's the kind of thing yeah. that we would present in the plan for those protocols and it's certainly something that they've considered already with those tent events. And then, you know, the, again, consider the number of events. I know you can't some of this gets to be a critical condition issue in Stoke Club's Highland, and we won't go into all that, but but it is a little bit, it is always nice for neighbors, it's this thing to go forward, to know that there's going to be, you know, a weekend or two where they aren't going to have to have any be exposed to that kind of thing. So, um, anyhow, I won't try to write it for you. That's not our job. No, we'll, we'll you know, just want you, some time to yeah, put it together. together. Sure. Thank you. We understand that it's a sensitive thing we want to try to address at the crap board. Okay, great. Um, you said time out. Yeah. Um, well, 
I think we covered everything we need to cover in eight, I believe. Um, and we can go back if someone, if someone wants to correct me on that at some point. Um, let's talk a little bit about traffic. And the criteria of five. So, uh, as part of the uh, GGO Institute project, we did have a traffic impact study prepared by Lamar and Dickinson, submitted as part of the Active 50 record. Um, and this uh, traffic impact assessment actually was uh, prepared to request the VTRANS um, when we were going through the process of getting the letter of intent for the new driveway on Route 66. They, they had asked for it. Um, so they did have a chance to review it, and they had they didn't have any significant comments about the conclusion of the traffic impact study from one of Dickinson. Um, and essentially, the impact study is, is divided into two sections. There's um, congestion and safety. Um, so let me bring this up here so everyone can see it. Um, typically, um, the, the standard uh, way of assessing traffic congestion, congestion is with a, a level of service analysis. Um, so this is just an example of what that means. Um, the, the traffic engineers calculated um, the background traffic uh, using both uh, data sources that were published from counts that VTRANS did, and also they took data from the um, traffic study that was prepared for the new um, Ag Lab building, the State Ag Lab building up at VTC. Um, so they were including the, the projected trips from that on top of the background counts from VTRANS as well. Um, so they calculate the, um, the, the existing level of traffic um, as it is without the project, and then existing level of traffic with the project, and then they project out five years of traffic growth. They do five years of projected five years without the project, projected five years with the project, um, and then they, for this particular analysis, they selected the project driveway, um, the uh, 89 interchange, and then the intersection um, where Route 66 takes a left up by VTRANS. I'm, I'm sorry, um, VTC. Um, so those were the intersections of interest. Once you get beyond those intersections, it gets a, a lot harder to predict where people are going. So, but um, you know, if you can show that there's no significant traffic impact at those closest intersections, you can assume that there's even less impact as you go further away from the site. So uh, level of service is measured on the average um, delay that a, a person driving would experience um, trying to make a movement at an intersection. So typically the worst level of service is for a left turn because you have to wait for people for a hole in traffic. Um, so these are the criteria for the various levels of service, A through F, um, and then average seconds of delay for each um, level. The VTRANS standard for uh, unsignalized intersections is level of service D or better, which represents around a 30 second delay when you get to the intersection between when you stop and when you can get out into traffic. Uh, so the- Has that changed? I mean, statutorily, I didn't even, I didn't even think D. There's some case law, okay, go ahead. I'm just curious, I haven't read the case law again on that for a while. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's, um, all based like on the approaching the frustrating level of when people are going to go dashing out. And yeah, and I think down. honestly that's probably how they develop it, is when, when is the point where it becomes dangerous <laughs> because we are making unsafe movements. Right. So yeah, no, um, I, I am not a traffic engineer, so I can't tell you how VTRANS came up with D, but I will rely on the traffic engineer that we hired to know that D is the appropriate level of service. It's, wow. it's a little bit neither here nor there for this discussion, right. so see in a second. Yeah, good. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this is the results of the intersection capacity. Um, so we have the interstate um, on and off ramps, we have the project access, and then we have uh, Vermont 66 up by VTRANS. So um, this is indicating levels of service. So the no build is without the hotel, build is with the hotel. So assuming that it's built in 2020, five years later it's 2025. Um, as you can see, the, the construction of the hotel has no effect on the level of service anywhere. Um, any of the, there's no change in any of the categories of level of service with or without the hotel. Um, and even the projected impacts at worst are an increase of about one second uh, down here at the uh, interstate. And hardly any impact at all by VTRANS tenths of a second uh, worth of impact rel you know, relative to the positive traffic. So, um, Given the, given the level of traffic coming, that we're expecting to come out of this, uh, at, and this is all, I should mention, 
This is all done at um, the peak hour of traffic on adjacent streets at the, um, the, the design hour, which is the 30th, 30th percentile highest traffic um, day of the entire year. 30, 30th highest day. Anyway, it's, a, it's, a high, it's not the most high traffic, but it is like statistically heavy traffic at which these are um, calculated. So that's, you're not expecting to have any, any real significant impact on the capacity. Um, in terms of traffic, uh, safety is usually typically um, assessed with uh, sight distances. So when you're sitting at the um, project uh, driveway, how far can you see in each direction? How far from your cars can you see you in each direction? Um, that stuff is all, uh, based on FHWA. Um, so the recommended, uh, so there's two kinds of sight distance. There's intersection sight distance and stopping sight distance. Mm -hmm. Intersection sight distance is based on um, getting a 7.5 second gap in traffic, which is what the traffic gurus have figured is what you need to be able to get out into traffic without significantly disrupting the flow of traffic. Um, the stopping sight distance is the amount of distance you need to safely stop if a car pulls out in front of you without hitting them. Um, so typically you use the intersection site distance when you're analyzing the safety of a new intersection. Um, we have, uh, we well exceed, so the, for the 40 miles an hour is the speed limit in the vicinity, 445 feet is the intersect, the recommended intersection site distance. So we have 600 feet to the west downhill. Um, currently, and I should mention that these are also measured at a point that's 15 feet back from the edge of the right of way. Um, so that is additionally a bit conservative because I think most people, their eye isn't 15 feet back from the edge right before they turn out into traffic. Um, but there's right now there's 400 feet to the east uphill, which is slightly less than the 445 we need. Um, but there is a group, uh, and that's mostly limited by the tree line along the wetland. As, and then that corner as it goes around it's sort of turns into the wetland. Um, but so there's a group of trees that stick out further than the rest. Um, and they're, uh, the, the major, they're the major impediment that's causing that 405 foot sight distance. Um, it's like a group of two to three trees uh, all together uh, just on the other side of the ditch there. Um, so we are planning to um, remove those trees uh, from there and then we can improve our sight distance to 450 feet which exceeds the recommended 445 feet. Um, so, uh, though, though it's downhill and there are a few curves there, you know, we, we picked the point of the driveway in order to maximize the sight distance and uh, with that small, um, like when one multi-trunk tree that needs to come down, uh, we'll have adequate sight distance in both directions. Do they, um, I know we had a hearing once where um, Despite the recommendations of the speed limit, they actually, uh, the attorney opposing the project was able to show that, that in some ways that wasn't relevant, that you should actually look at the actual speed limit, which in many cases is considerably higher. You mean the actual speed of traffic? Yeah, the actual speed yeah, of traffic. Yeah, I, I mean, I have heard of that being done, but it's not the, it's not the standard to which the projects are typically reviewed. It's pretty effective, though. Yeah. But you know, we didn't do a project-specific count for this, and VTrans didn't ask us to do a project-specific count, and that's where you collect the data on. Mm -hmm. I think what you're referring to is the 85th percentile speed. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I certainly have seen that happen at projects before, but um, there wasn't enough concern from VTrans after their review to ask us to do beyond this uh, standard step of evaluating the site distances based on the uh, posted speed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I suppose they're not the only ones that could be concerned, but um, you mentioned somewhere that uh, it would be over a thousand cars, just slightly over a thousand cars. I think it was on your Act 250 application under 1,039. 1,039, wasn't yeah. it? At, right. Yeah. And that was... Um, With 59 at peak. Yeah. I guess I... Just, I was a little dumbfounded by that. If you're having a, if you're having a conference there, and the conference is going to start at nine o'clock in the morning, ten o'clock in the morning, or whatever. And I would think you certainly, being geographically in the center of the state, would like to do that. I mean, we have a 
Vermont small fruit and vegetable growers, we go to the Lake Morianna every year. And gosh, why should we do that when we were off at 89 and the center of the state, right? Um, I like your thinking. <laughs> um, but, but, and that gets, that may even get more than 400. You may be limited in some You may become there. popular. Um, we hope so. But, so, yeah. I mean, you, when you have to get everybody in then, I mean, that didn't really, this study didn't seem to address that really, from what I could tell. So the the way that these these what we typically look at is not the daily number of trips, it's the number of trips that are gonna affect traffic congestion, which is looking at that peak hour, right? This traffic congestion is only a problem the number of trips is only a problem if the capacity of the road can't accommodate the number of cars that are there. So that's why we don't generally look at a day day long number, we look at the peak hour number. Um, so these these peak hour numbers are the way they determine them is the Institute of Traffic Engineers has, since the 80s, gone around and collected data from um, traffic counts from various sites all around the country. Mm -hmm. um, and then they've broken them down into categories and they provided the statistics on traffic generation for each category. Um, so the particular category here, um, number 310, the hotel category, um, the hotels that they were performing counts, traffic counts at were hotels that had restaurants and conference facilities in them. They don't provide a separate um, traffic generation for the hotel from the conference center. So when they've counted those and they've, they've statistically come up with these peak, peak hour trips, those are at hotels that have conference centers already. So it includes both the hotel traffic and the conference center traffic. Um, and, and frankly, uh, when I first looked at it, I, I threw the, the uh, restaurant traffic in there too, but uh, B-Trans didn't agree with us on that one. So we're having the restaurant counted as a separate uh, generator. Uh, and in fact, they're conserving, conservatively using um, the peak traffic numbers from high turnover restaurants, which is like your McDonald's or your fast casual Chipotle, things like that. Um, it's not necessarily the kind of restaurant we're gonna have here, but in order to conservatively estimate the peak traffic impacts and use the more, uh, the, the use that generates more traffic, so. Um, but you're saying there's nothing for like a conference where you would have a large number of people coming in at one time and then a large number of people exiting. Well, certainly that may, certainly that may happen, but that would be reflected in the data that we're using. So when they do these counts, they don't just like count for an hour; they'll set up for a day or a week or something, and and the count will reflect what is the um, how many cars are going in and out. And they give you two in various ways. You can get it the, the peak hour of the actual use. You can get it the peak hour of the adjacent streets. Typically, we use the peak hour of the adjacent streets because that's the point that you have the most impact on levels of service and stuff. So, while there's not a specific like breakout for like if you have a big event, um, you know this this is a typical sized conference facility for a hotel of this size uh, when you look around the country. And, and those trips are they're built in to the number that we're using. Yeah, but um, this doesn't show any conference here. Right, because the way they did the statistics was based on the number of rooms in the hotel. But the hotel also had a conference center. You see what I'm saying? I so, see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. But your conference center is not 79 rooms. It, let's say two people would be 100, you know, 160 people or so. It's 400 capacity. It's a lot bigger. Well, sure, but most hotels have far more conference capacity than we have capacity for rooms. You're not expecting everyone who comes to a conference. No, I just wanted to see it reflected. I don't, you're trying to convince me that this word hotel includes the conference. I just don't get it. Really. Uh, well, I, I didn't bring the book with me. Because I would have thought <laughs> it was important you know, to see that. I mean, I think um, if there is uh, some conference that is letting out a, a peak traffic time, the applicant would be willing to implement management procedures, yeah. you know, having somebody out there in a desk directing traffic and making sure that things aren't safe. <coughs> but the town wasn't concerned about it. We presented this to the town and, and the they, police they or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, VTrans reviewed both the traffic generation calculations and the impact calculations, and the, their traffic engineers didn't have any issue with it either. So I, I understand that it's a little hard to disentangle, but because the hotels, I mean, you need something to, to predict on, basically. And you never know exactly what's gonna happen, but the best you can do is 
have a wide net of a statistical analysis. And because these traffic counts were performed at hotels that do have conference centers, um, then they should reflect the traffic from both uses. <clears throat> We did get the letter of intent from the state of Vermont. On the, no, no, I just, it doesn't I mean, make any sense. I mean, if you got 400 people coming to a conference and you got, say, two in a car, that's, you know, 200 car trips, and you only showing you at the peak hour coming to the conference, 22 people coming in, 22 cars coming in. And then exiting 15, well, presumably they wouldn't be exiting, that'd be a few hotel guests leaving. So you need another category, you're saying they need another category that would be just conference well yeah, yeah I mean just the thing is there isn't one so yeah. I mean this is the standard this is the this is what everyone uses to estimate the traffic impacts across the country well okay let's just for a moment I'm just I don't mean to argue with you about this I'm just kind of, let's say we didn't have a hotel this is just going to be a big conference center okay and all they do is conferences right so what, now what would you be using for a traffic study? I think you'd have to ask a traffic engineer, and I'm not a traffic engineer. Uh -huh. Okay. All I know is that the traffic it's engineer not prepared this, project, and this yeah. is the appropriate land use category to ask. Well, let me put it a different way. We're at Riverside, when we've done dealt with them, because they do acknowledge that there'll be lots of people coming all at once, they actually hire someone to manage the traffic on those days, right? Yeah. yeah. And they have someone out there in the road doing that kind of thing. And I certainly think that the applicant in this case would be willing to do that if, if that's needed. My only question is, coming down that hill, it's quite steep, it's quite fast. Now, I, I think you're going to have yeah. most of these people getting off the interstate, either coming south or north. So once they do that, then they're just going to be peeling into it. So I think they're in pretty good shape there. It'll be anybody coming down the hill. Um, yeah, it'll be leaving more than anything else where you might get more critical. So you have an employee there. Because I know there's no more police in Randolph. Right. Right. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. There is a sheriff department. Right, this, you get the Orange County Sheriff. Or and yeah. one of your and employees. And the state police. Yeah. You know, we're, we're not. You don't want to have the state police there. Yeah, I mean, regardless, if, if there is a particular event that we know is going to be getting out at a time when there's a lot of traffic, then you know, they can provide employees to manage the flow of traffic in and out of in and out of the yes. driveway. Yeah. I mean I don't I don't know how we present a traffic study to you that isn't done in the way that everyone does a traffic study. You know what I mean? Like this this is the standard way to do it. It was prepared by a traffic professional, it was reviewed by other traffic professionals at the state agency that I know I just find it irrelevant. But it's not though. Is it's it? irrelevant it's not because it, it doesn't deal with it doesn't criteria deal. Five. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're, we're looking at it from, from the standpoint of how does it safety and safety congestion issue, yeah. criteria five, so it's not just because VTrans has looked at it and said it's wonderful. Well, right, but I mean, there's no rebuttable presumption because of VTrans as to how we deal with this. Okay. Right. I guess I'm just struggling to present you with a different, a different evidence than the conclusions of a traffic engineer who's performing analysis on the safety and congestion that's relative to the project based on standard accepted engineering practices. I don't know how else to present yeah. it to you. Well, that's where the... It's going to make a recommendation <coughs> or a request. It's where that other, it's that RSG, which one is that that comes in and does that? But um, I'm not asking you to do that. Yeah, Laverne well, Dickinson is, is the yeah, same. No, no, competitive. I, I mean, it's a licensed it's traffic engineer. No, I get, I get, I get what you're saying. It's just, do you understand what I'm saying, though? I, I do I mean, understand. You do get it. I mean, understand right? what you're yep. saying. I mean, if you've got 400 people in a facility and it's 6 o'clock and they're out of their conference, it's a peak hour kind of issue of 5 o'clock, and they're headed home, they're all going to hit that intersection at once. And this is irrelevant to that. For that particular moment in time, at that particular conference. Yeah. So, so for that particular moment in time, if everyone gets out at once, the applicant's willing to provide staff Well, that's the kind of thing I didn't, control. but I didn't see that in the application anyway. Okay. Well. Um, well, because this data didn't didn't show that it required it. If you're saying with the logic that it would, then it then it would happen. I think of a, a factory letting out 400 employees, and what happens there? Well, the backup on the property. And then they, they leave, you know, as well, they can. Well, they're going to back up on this property, too, and they're going to be getting 
more anxious like I do. I don't like to wait at all to get out of there. And they're going to be turning left now coming out because they're all going to be getting back on the interstate. And so and you're going to be having that track coming down that hill, you know, faster than 40 miles an hour, I can guarantee you. Um, I don't think there's any of us in this room, even us over 60, that probably wouldn't be at least trying to hit through brakes, but generally going faster. So, I mean, I, I think it's something to definitely consider doing. I, I think that if it's that if it's needed like that, that would be prudent for you know it's a combination of when the thing is booked and are people all going to be leaving, and you know at the same time could be an event as well, you know, yeah, not just I mean, uh, the same. Someone will go eat dinner in your restaurant, that'd be right? Good. And and maybe there'll be an attenuation as as people leave, or you're not going to you know maybe go have a drink in the bar before you go. But uh, I I think that from the analysis standpoint, it's as far as we can take it. If in practice, you find that every year when when your group comes in, you actually <laughs> all get up and go out at the same time so we have a, a stack up, mm -hmm. then your meeting planner and your meeting people are going to say, hey, we've got to have some traffic control, mm -hmm. either on site or out at, the, out at the highway. And I think it's, I mean, it's like you don't, you don't build a church for Christmas and Easter, right? So you deal with you deal with those big, big events, especially. And I want those people leaving happy, too. I don't want them to have a bad experience by being lined up and not being able to get out safely. I, want I think it can be dealt with on. Yeah. Well, no, we don't deny under five, as you probably know. We just try to work things out so it's right. safer. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. 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 Yes. I have a question. The studies of other hotels, were they single lane? Because most hotels that I go to have, have two lanes on either side. <clears throat> Here we're talking about a single lane down and a single lane up. So, I mean. So that's a bit separate from the, the data that I'm talking about. The studies of other hotels that I'm talking about are only relative to the number of cars going in and out. And then the analysis of the, of the single lane exit was done um, specifically for this project. So the capacity analysis says we have a two lane stop control to exit, and then they use that um, and some uh, you know, in standard engineering principles to predict how long it's gonna take you to turn out. So the fact that the two lane um, entrance and exit is taken into account specifically for this project, the configuration of the project driveway. Mm -hmm. Did that answer your question? Yes. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Well, I'd just like to say one way you could help that turning of traffic problem is for people just to go up to DTC, which is a conference center. And so this is competition for the, an established conference center. And I think that's not a good idea. But you could just go straight up the road to where that one is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Which conference center is that at VTC? VTC. What you wear? Which building? The whole thing, they do conferences. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I understand what he's getting at as far as you got to use something as a basis to, to do the study and everything. Uh, uh, I'm going off, off a 12 year study of me pulling to the end of my road and trying to pull out of there the last 12 years, and every year, at least three times a year, I always get clipped going there. Because of the fact it's 40, and everybody does 50. Down below me is the blind corner coming up from the interstate. Up just up above where they're entering is another corner above me that they're coming down. So you got traffic going there. By the time you hit your gas, there's people on you coming down there. Uh, I can, the only feasible way, and I don't know who, who can do that, is the reduction of the speed limit because the volume of that traffic is going to go, you cannot factor in when the conference is, because they don't know when the conferences are and when their peak is or anything, they haven't even built it yet. But I can guarantee you that uh, it's, it's going to go up to where I'm not going to get out of my driveway unless I, I take a chance. Uh, to get out of there from going left to go to work. 
Uh, so an actual uh, speed reduction, I don't know if I get with the town or anything, to slow it down might be one of the, the benefits, so I at least have, well, it says I got, you know, I have to wait 10 seconds, but. Uh, no, it's a state road. No. AOT's already looked at it. Yeah, yeah, so. Uh, Where it needed to be done. It's a state road. It's a state road. It's a state Route road, 66. so it would have to be the state to reduce it, because. Mm -hmm. And they've already looked over the application. Okay. Uh, just out of curiosity, what, what kind of collisions have been in that area? Uh, so they do, as part of the safety, they do review the high crash locations. Um, so there's no high crash location at the project. The closest, the closest high crash location is on the other side of the highway by McDonald's. Uh, uh, I, I know someone who's killed in that. Yeah. Yeah, Smith. I have my... my uh, uh, mailbox taken out at least once a year by people coming through. That, that's an icy stretch there. Mm -hmm. And I've shoved it in the driver in the bank and had them hit my bank and stuff. You know how they pay attention to you instead of the road. So it gets very dangerous in the winter, too. I, I might just add regarding. Um, Oak Bridge Lane, is that right? Oak Bridge mm -hmm. Lane? Yes. Um, the reason why we, part of the reason why we put the driveway where we did is because the site distances are significantly worse at Oak Bridge Lane than they are at the location where we yes. proposed the driveway. Yeah, so no, we located that. the driveway at the location along the site that maximized the safety and site distance that along the choice of where we could put it in our frontage. And we actually own Oak Lane and they have a right of way across it. Um, and we're, we're trying to be sensitive Ooh, to the nature. We own Oak Lane, which shows it on the survey. But there's a right away there. There's a right away there. Yeah. Okay, for BTC and anybody living on it. We'll be on the land underneath. Yeah, right away. Can those trees be open? Yeah, well, with, with you owning the land either way, anybody that owns land there has a right away to it, so mm -hmm. you have no. ownership. Well, I asked them to chop yeah, a few right. trees down on either side. Yeah, I was going to say, I wondered well, if it could trees, be opened up. It's not the trees, it's the corners. There's a sharp corner there. I go to the end of my driveway. I can see down as far as the corner, which is 70 yards. People come around there 50 miles an hour, not 40, 50 at least. Sometimes 40 when they slow down. And then up above, it's great where they're putting their entrances is up above. I can still see somebody pulling out there, but right above them, there's an, another corner that I can't see. So either way, I'm telling the traffic's going to be a little bit faster, a little bit more. Now, my concern is with the extra traffic, I'm going to get a quarter of the amount of time to get out. Mm -hmm. Did you say you were tired? Yes. It's still broken. Next year, you'll just be staying home then, won't you? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, well, yeah. We also wanted to be sensitive and not share the no. same road that residences were on, and we were trying to meet no. the neighbors' concerns about. No, no, I yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's all. I'm we were trying to be good neighbors by creating yeah. our and own access. There's nothing you can paper. do about it. Is yeah. that for reducing the speed or widening the road? Which yeah, widening. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But AOT looked at the project and said it wasn't needed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, full of. Um, traffic and, and seeing things, um, I don't mean to be a, a nuisance here, but um, does that sign really have to be quite as big as that? I mean, maybe not. I Do you I share my what feeling I a little bit? I, I mean, do. It's pretty big for um, the area. It meets the local zoning requirements. The sign well, I'm on the plan. That might be. I know you there have might a, be a different across shade. the street that has about 10 different things on it or a number mm -hmm. of different things. Right. But, That's but it. let's see rate. if I could bring that up. I'm just curious. I'm not sure that the... The mothership? No, nah, it's, it's more of a... Stone? It's 12 feet 6 inches tall from the average grade, and then it's 8 feet... Sign itself. One and a half inches, final. the sign itself, and then you got eight square feet on your restaurant sign, four by two. Um, I just was as much asking as anything. It just seemed, I, I, I can't quite visualize it in that spot. I think that's one of the problems is that we um, got the 
the, the renderings, what I, what I submitted and everything, uh, without being able to put it into our slides. Mm -hmm. And that might help to, you know, get it into scale as opposed to this. I wanted to get this in because it did meet the local uh, mm -hmm. requirements. Whether we look at it aesthetically, it's, it's too much. I mean, that's something up for the owners to, to determine. So that one you submitted on, on, as an exhibit, that's different than what shows up in the red room? No, the location and everything is is there. I don't know yeah, if the rendering is to scale yeah, or it's just pretty like, close, but it's yeah. Because oh, okay. it looks it well, smaller on there, I thought. Really, this, this was an older yeah. prior to that. See? Yeah, well, that's sort of a short Well, if the fence yeah. is maybe four and a half, five yeah. feet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a little yeah. tricky because I mean that yeah. road. I mean I feel like I'm not on that road anymore. That I'm somewhere back. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're the architect. You tell me where I am. Really, I'm not on the road anymore yeah. from this perspective. Well, the yeah. I mean the it's hard really from a different angle or from a photo from the road. I think would be a good perspective to look at to, mm -hmm. to get a sense of that. Um, we have a long way away right now. I, feel like. mm -hmm. I don't see the restaurant sign below it, but. Yeah, it's, it's just because this rendering was done yeah. back in April, right. so we yeah. didn't have as many details about the sign yeah. then as we do sure. now. You want to keep it above the snow? Yeah, my yeah. son's a landscape cool. architect down in Massachusetts. He's telling me about all the tricks they do to get around there. People like us and whatnot. <laughs> I have a question about the placement of that. Is it most of the people coming from, from the right? Why isn't it on the other side? So they can see it. Well, that's a, I mean, that is, you've got it skewed towards us over in the boonies over here. Well, it's not. It, the orientation of the sign, if you look at the site plan, is actually opposite of the way it looks there. Yeah. It's actually closer to oriented than a thing. Yeah. If you look. Oh, okay. Landscape plan. Well, it's on the it's on the, it's on the west side instead of on the east side. But you want to be, you want to get people to see it as soon as. As soon as they can, to alert them to it. You don't. I mean, you, to move it up another 40 feet it's could it's have another 40 feet. That, that thing is 40 feet wide. You're no, 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 no. But if I'll you were to half feet wide, yeah, it's 12 feet. Almost. No, I'm, feet. Talk, I'm saying you have the driveway. The other side of the driveway. If you, if you put it on the other side of the driveway, in other words, instead of being right like there, up. if I'm looking for it and I'm coming up from the west, I'm going to see it better. If it's on the right side of your driveway as we're looking at it now, then on the left, aren't I? I mean, aren't you? Yeah. Aren't you? Isn't aren't most of your customers coming up from the left? Yes, which is why we put the sign before the driveway. Before so the driveway, see the sign and then see the driveway. Yeah. But it's, it's too late by the time you. Yeah, if it's on the other side of the driveway, you've gone by the by it before you get the yeah, sign. Anyway. Which, if you ask me, isn't that helpful? But. Okay. Off the subject, I have to get to work for you. Sure. Oh, okay. How do I find out any results or any information on this <laughs> okay. if I'm not You've here? Got your name and, and contact information. You'll yes, get, you'll so get you can send something out. out yep. Okay, thank you yeah. for your time. Yeah. Excuse you. me. Yep. Semper Fi. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Do we know what kind of restaurant it is? Has anyone ever said? <laughs> no. Not yet. Uh, then that's not meant. Is that at a requirement of the Act 250? No. All right. No. Then, yeah, no. I don't know yet. Still working on it. Still working on it. Pizza place. No, it won't no. be a pizza place. No. <laughs> it's going to be a restaurant that is able to provide meals to the conference center and stuff. It's not going to be a pizza joint or a fast food restaurant or anything. Well, the economy, the way it is, well, I wonder five years from now if you're going to have enough company. Customers to fill all these spaces. That's how good the food is, right? No. <laughs> no, no, no. It's Vermont restaurant. I mean, that name, you pretty much got to do food to table, don't you, son? Oh, yeah, I would. But from a kitchen design, it's got to be able to accommodate both. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to bring up that. I don't know how I totally feel about it. But anyhow, I was just curious about that, if you thought about that. Um, now we're going to go to water. Um, and maybe the engineers, they can explain 
the situation with that. Now, the, the basic, um, I can't get on my internet. I guess I can. I can look that up while you do this. But the criteria says will not unreasonably burden any existing water supply. So how do you prove that for these folks who live a mile away? So right now, and, and we've been in this process for quite a while, we are uh, working our way through the source permitting process with the state drinking water and groundwater protection division. Um, we're required to go through this permitting process because of the level of this, of this proposed uh, hotel and conference center will classify the, the on-site water system as a public water system. Even though it's privately owned, it's regulated like it's a public water system. Um, so for the source permitting process, what we've done so far is we were working with a professional hydrogeologist um, who cited the wells uh, at a favorable location based on um, bedrock fracture analysis. Um, and so uh, that analysis and the proposed well location was sent to the state for review. They reviewed it through the location. We drilled the first well. Um, unfortunately, the first well didn't uh, have the kind of yield we needed for the project. So we put in another application to drill another well, same information, sent it to the state, got it approved, drilled the second well. Um, and so the, the second well has had a short-term driller's yield test performed uh, that uh, gives an estimate of its capacity at 150 gallons a minute. Um, frankly, 150 gallons a minute could probably supply most of the town of Randolph with water. It's a lot of water. <laughs> um, but, um, based on uh, calculations of the water use um, using the um, daily usage estimation uh, estimates that are for published in the state water supply rules, um, we're looking at about 19,000 gallons a day of water use or 26-ish gallons a minute uh, of pumping out of the well, uh, which roughly has the capacity for 150 gallons a minute. So based on that, the next step, and we've just gotten approval from the state to do this, uh, is we do a long-term pumping test to determine the safe yield of the well. Um, and what that means is that um, based on the amount of water use that we have, um, the state in the water supply rules has designated um, a certain uh, radius around the well uh, which is the area um, that the well may potentially be affecting uh, other wells drawing water out of the same aquifer as the well that we propose. So based on our proposed uses, that monitoring radius is 2,000 feet. Um, so our hydrogeologist has identified all of the wells within that 2,000 foot radius, um, and we've just sent out letters to all of the owners of the wells within that radius, asking them permission to monitor their wells during the pump test. So. Everyone who gives us permission, um, we will go to their property, um, open up their well, put a water level monitoring device in the well. Um, we'll monitor the background level of the groundwater, both at the project well and then at all of the wells that we have permission to monitor within 2,000 foot radius for a week or so to see what the um, existing situation of the aquifer is like. And then, uh, we'll perform uh, a, a test where we pump out of the well uh, at a constant rate for 72 hours, so three days straight. Um, and then during that, we'll be logging both the water level in the well and the water level in any of the wells that we have permission to, um, to monitor within the monitoring radius. Um, so that test, the intention of the test is to both um, assure us and the state and everyone else that if we are um, so th that's pumping at the like the maximum amount we'd, amount we'd expect to pump from the well. You, you were, you, the way you calculate that is taking your, if, as if you used your whole day's water and you pumped it out in 12 hours. So we're going to take that rate of one day over 12 hours and do it for three days straight and see how much where the water level ends up in the well. Um, so we have to show that that isn't going to that the well can provide enough water. Um, without dewatering to, to satisfy that demand, which is beyond what we expect to be doing normally in the well. And then we also have to show that there is no um, significant uh, or detrimental interference with the water level in the wells in the monitoring areas. So the hydrogeologists will look at that data. Um, you know, and so because we're pumping at like one-fifth of the well's estimated capacity, 
we're not really anticipating that there's going to be any uh, significant interference at all. If, if we do find that there's interference with those wells, um, then we're required by the state law um, to, to mitigate that, whether that's um, you know, drilling another well into a different aquifer so we have two sources, whether that's um, providing additional sources of water to the, the people that are affected or things like that. There's a, we have to go changing the rate of withdrawing water. Some, somehow we have to fix it. But we're not, again, we're not expecting that there's going to be any significant interference. So um, at the conclusion of that test, the hydrogeologists will write a report, including any remedies, um, as well as a source protection plan, and then submit it to the state hydrogeologist for review. Um, so uh, all in all, uh, if we will see what the effect of the well is and how far that goes during this pump test, um, you know, it's, it's very unlikely that it will be anywhere outside of this 2,000 foot influence radius, and uh, certainly not anyone up on the top of the hill or, um, the, or the Randolph uh, Center Fire District, uh, which has a well, the well at VTC feeds into the Randolph Center Fire District, as well as they have a spring um, feeding the fire district up there. So, um, you know, there's certainly quite a lot more water withdrawal at the top of the hill um, much closer to anyone who's in Randolph Center and not on the fire district's water system than our project would have. Um, so we're certainly more than happy to submit the, um, the testing result report to the state. Um, we're also going to have to be um, submitting the uh, approved source permit as well as the approved construction permit for the public water system to you guys before you'll be issuing the Act 250 permit. So with that much GPM, you'd never clear the charge. I, I mean, that's, that's the hope. It's, it's a little, um, the reason why you have to do the longer test is sometimes, sometimes there's things that might affect the well capacity you don't see a short test in the way a well drill would usually do it. The well drill will pump it for like an hour or two. Um, and you may see something different when you pump it for three days, but that's why you have to do it for so long. So you have a very robust um, test of the well to make sure that it will provide the capacity that is needed to serve the project over a long period of time. What's the pump capacity that you're proposing putting down that you need? Uh, well, it, it's going to it's going to be around that. Let me think about it for a second. There's three horses, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think I think we're going to be required to put a pump that would be able to meet it over 12 hours, but we wouldn't put it more than that. So we'll be at that 26. It'll it'll be around the pump test rate. That will, that will capacity, but it won't be designed to pump all the time. You know what I mean? So in this test, we're pumping continuously for three days, and we would expect that at most you would pump 12 hours at that rate each day. So you have 12 hours, uh, half the day, for the well to recover and not for the recovery before you start. In reality, it'll be like in smaller chunks more often, um, but we are also providing a, a portable water storage tank here. Um, so that both is for um, chlorination, uh, disinfection purposes, but it also um, makes it so you're not pumping out of the well as often to serve the demand. Mm -hmm. So you, have, you store a bunch of water in this tank, you use it up slowly as the day goes by, and the well pump is only turned on when you need to refill Well, as shallow as that well is, you don't have very much static. We don't have much storage right there. Right. We have capacity, but not storage. Yeah. Right. Right. So, but we will have we'll have additional storage anyway. Did you get a permit from that? You alluded to a couple of different things. Do we get a rebuttable presumption out of this? Or from this yeah. Yeah. What's what's the permit again? There'll be a uh, two of them at least for the water system. There'll be the source permit, which permits the, which is what the process we're in right now, which is the permit that says. Yes, this well has the capacity to serve the demands that we want to place on it. Then there's the construction permit, which um, will review the um, storage distribution and treatment of, of the water system to make sure that it's compliant with public water system regulations. And then there's the wastewater permit, but because we're a public water system, the wastewater permit won't, uh, they don't have any jurisdiction over the water system, they'll just be for the connection to the. What part of that, though, so is that complies with our three that you're not? It would be the source permit and the construction source permit. permit. Yeah. Okay. We did get the allocation from the town on the sewer. Um, yeah. So yeah, we, we have to have that. Um, that sounds reasonably expensive, which you know. It's very expensive, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it is very expensive. Yeah. 
it's, I mean, it's, it's a very robust test, and it's the same level of testing that if Randolph, the t if the town of Randolph wanted to build a new municipal water system, they would do the same test that we're doing for this hotel. It's, it's, it's robust, for sure. Does that allay any of your fears or concerns? Uh, well, here's the thing. Uh, supposing it doesn't work. Uh, it, there was a, a situation about 25 years ago where there was a development outside of Burlington. I think it was in Williston. And then there was a development next to them, near them. And the first development lost its water. So it, uh, the um, aquifer of Randolph has not been mapped. They have been mapping bit by bit, town by town, aquifers throughout the state. Randolph never requested it, even though we asked Randolph to do so. So Randolph doesn't have its aquifers mapped. We don't know, at the 2,000 feet, we don't know what the size of the aquifer is in Randolph. Furthermore, aquifers in Vermont are shallow and and, and small. They're a series of small ones. It's not like in the Midwest or the West Weather, which they have this huge thing that runs for thousands of miles, which they are, by the way, over pumping. But um, we have a lot of smaller ones. So if, the, if they start to pump this, and it pumps for more than three days, it pumps for a while, what is the renewal of the aquifer? Because you've got a whole uh, 25 acres of macadam and uh, uh, you know non-porous uh, item, non-porous surfaces. So the water is going to come there, drain off, go down to the sewer system, go down to the Randolph uh, uh, treatment center, go out to the Connecticut Valley. It is not going to replenish the water system here, whereas people with wells and and uh, so you telling me you're criticizing the tests that are required. By I the state know I, if the te I, I'm saying if the test is wrong and it can be wrong, it has been wrong in other situations. They did that test in Williston, and then they did that test in the next development. They had to, and the test proved fine until people moved in, used the water. And the other so what more would you like them to do? I would like to have some kind of, uh, some sort of way of, if, if my well goes dry, that somebody's going to drill me a new well and restore my water. Well, the state's requiring 2,000 feet. How far away are you? I'm about 5,000 feet. How many feet did you say they drilled before they hit bedrock? Here? Um, I want to say like 30. We started because we had to do 50 feet of casing. Right, it was less than the bedrock. We had to do extra casing. So you hit bedrock for two grades. Uh, but you still had to do the 50 feet yeah. we would require. Yeah. It's, not, it's not on the atlas yet. <laughs> what, this well? Yeah. No, I doubt it. <laughs> so, I mean, I just want to be protected if, if I lose my water. How many yeah. wells? You said you're going to monitor wells with a, a radius. There's, a, I think there's about eight inside the radius. We may not monitor them all because we may not get permission to monitor them all. Um, but there's certainly a few that are very close to the project and will be monitors. One of them is um, Harry Armstrong, one of the partners of the project, is one of the abutting landowners, so we'll certainly monitor his well. Um, we were just discussing with Mr. Shabbat at the break that he's received his letter. Um, and he verbally expressed to us that he signed it and will send it back as soon as possible because he's interested in making sure that his water supply. So those water supplies are going to be significantly closer than 2,000 feet to the, to the project. So if the test is going to show any effect on water supplies, it will show it at these wells. And the effect at these wells will be much greater than effect, any effect at a further away well. I mean, I can go into the science if you want to. No, it's just a curiosity <laughs> question. How, how many sure. were within it's, that it's around. It's not, I mean, there's, there's not a ton of them in there, but it's around eight. Yeah. It does take in McDonald's and the barn, right? No, oh, no. it okay. takes in the old Vermont Pure Building and then actually even a couple of the houses that are on that road that comes down from the center, like behind Vermont Pure, you know those? Oh, yes. Yeah. Up oh, on that the is for there. Yep. Does it get up as years. far as uh, Apple, what did you call that? Oh, oh Morgan, Morgan just, they're on the they're on the they're on the Randolph Fire District. Oh, yeah, Randolph Center Fire District. Oh, yeah, that's right. 
And, and again, I, I would say, you know, if, if anyone loses their water up in Randolph Center, it's far more likely it's because of the fire district than it is because of our project, because they're pumping out of a well and a spring up there, that's the top of the hill. Um, and relative to the, re the comments about groundwater recharge, um, the soils here are 60% um, or more silt soils. Um, so, and we are, have clear evidence that the aquifer that we're pumping out of isn't connected to the, the, surface, uh, the surface aquifer at this location. If it were, we wouldn't have an artesian well. The height of the water in the well would be at the height of the, uh, of the groundwater when you dug down from the ground. So if you have water that's coming up higher than the ground, it's coming from a source that is separated from the water that's filtering in through rainwater. So while I can't tell you exactly what's feeding this aquifer, it's not, it's not water, it's infiltrating from rainwater on the site. Between the high, the, the very low permeability salt soils and the confined aquifer that we're dealing with. I don't understand I really studied hydrogeology. Did, okay. I'm not a hydrogeologist. I never studied light design <laughs> or traffic. <laughs> yes. Um, so it, I'm just curious how the radius was determined, uh, the thousand or two thousand feet, and um, then I would follow up to that. Environmental protection rules. Um, so given, uh, assuming that the aquifer has not been mapped, would be an uh, undue burden if, for example, Ms. Sachs and Ms. Rice were willing to sign off that their wells could be tested for quantity and quality purposes, um, despite the fact that they're outside of that radius. Would that be an onerous burden to ensure that their concerns are um, would be addressed if, in fact, there was an impairment to their their flow or quality of their, of their I think I, I think the the first question I'd have on that would be being able to show cause I mean what if if the project goes ahead and then something hopefully not ever happens to one of the wells how do you link them well that's for the scientists to determine I guess um, well but it that's seems why they like have state if, rules. if there is a level of uh, confidence that they're too far outside um, the distance by which they would be impacted, um, then there shouldn't, I don't know what the objection would be. Well, the objection would be because clearly there could be dozens of other reasons for a well to go dry that have nothing to do with the project. Beyond so, the fact that if we start opening up the radius to people who are outside of the, the area that's required by state regulations was to stop someone else coming along and asking for their well to be tested too, and then we end up testing every single well in Randolph Center. It's not here today. That's what prevents you and protects you from something. No. Well, I think we have to, there's been, um, we did Act 250 rightly or wrongly under some of these more scientific um, criteria, rebuttable presumptions placed here. Um, what that means is if if they get a pass or you know do the testing that's required um, from the agency and natural resources or whatever agencies are involved, then as to Act 250, there's a rebuttable presumption that they comply with that criteria. And um, I, I, you know, as a lay person with respect to this, I don't feel that I, you know, I need to stay within what, what, what is presented to us and what is required of us relative to the existing law at this point. I, I can appreciate that, I'm, and I'm just kind of curious why you're asking whether that allays our my client's fears. Um, <laughs> what, what would well, it matter? Well, that's okay. Why I, you know, I just I'm <laughs> asking if you know he gave quite a lengthy explanation, mm -hmm. which you missed mm -hmm. most of, which involves the rather expensive and time-consuming um, um, protocol. What they're going to do, where they pump the well for what 72 hours, I recall, and at above maximum capacity of what you will be requiring, be pumping it out, and, uh, and for what your needs are, and that within 2,000 feet will be wells which presumably will be at greater risk than these wells, will be monitored if they give permission to them, and uh, it sounds like a pretty good uh, uh, and confident way to go about it. And 
so I thought it might have allayed their fears that if those wells don't pump down and don't have a problem, that theirs too would not have a problem. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the problem is the variables in terms of what the, the particular wells that will be tested, what their um, historical flows have been versus someone who may not have such a robust uh, number per gallon. So uh, it just doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal if they're going to do the pump testing anyway, which is a protocol I'm well familiar with. Um, it seems like it would not be so onerous um, to monitor two other wells. Well, we will take that under consideration. Thank you. Okay, I think we've covered everything. Um, I told you before and I had it. Yep. So, um, so what we'll, you know, before we recess, um, just to go over what happens next, you're probably familiar, we'll be issuing a recess memo. Some of what we discuss will definitely be in that recess memo. And uh, we may or may not reconvene again if we feel we need to. Um, but otherwise, there'll be an opportunity for all the parties to uh, respond and uh, kind of give and take back and forth by email and mail. Okay. Yes? Um, I'm sorry, since I did have to absent myself for the majority of the hearing, I was um, just wanted to know what your uh, decision, at least a provisional decision, on uh, the exit for open space We standard. created uh, exit for preliminary party status on um, criteria uh, three, three five, and eight. five, and eight. And have you deemed um, that the two members that are present have adequately participated during the hearing um, in order to be able to maintain that from a participation standpoint? Oh, from a participation standpoint, certainly, I would say. I'm mean, just speaking for the, but they've certainly participated. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you for all coming and we stay in recess. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you.